27th chapter, King Diagard of Cilia greeted them. Ray and Iriel bowed to the king. Diagard told them to raise their heads, and also said that he had heard that they were going to return to the Holy Kingdom. The girl said that they really have the opportunity to return to the Holy Kingdom. It's all thanks to the grace of the king, so she thanked him for it. The king said he didn't do anything for this, it was all thanks to the might of the Holy Kingdom. The girl said that thanks to the fact that he received them in Cilia, they were able to find the saint and their return would be possible. The girl also said that she would definitely return this debt to him. The king smiled and said that they would be happy to take advantage of this and turned to Ray asking if he was the new chosen saint. Diagard did not feel that he had mana in him, but looking at his body, it seemed to him that he had mastered the skill of the ball. He had only watched the appearance of the saint for the second time, so he was a little nervous, but now looking at him, he understood that he was not dangerous. The king said that it was a great honor for him to meet a saint and a saint in one place. Ray didn't really like it all, he wanted to leave quietly. The king turned to Ariel and told her that his cousin, the daughter of Archduke Silos, was ill. They invited a lot of priests, none of them could cure, even identify the disease, so he asked to look at this child once. Ray got a little angry and said that they didn't have any time for this because they still had a long way to go, but the girl agreed, saying that she couldn't refuse his majesty's request. The king was delighted, because now he has no reason to worry, the saints will take care of his cousin and thank Uriel. Ray is very indignant and asked why it was impossible to go to the holy kingdom right away. The girl told him that he doesn't understand anything, it's all because now he is also an employee of the holy kingdom, and if he learns to handle the divine power just by watching over her, it will be a big breakthrough of the world. Ray said that now they would spend a lot more time, because first they came to the duke's estate and only then they would go to the holy kingdom but soon resigned himself to this and said that since they were the only ones who could help, they should hurry up, because he would go anywhere if there was a patient there, who needs his help, because that is the duty of a doctor. They left the manor and went to the subjects of Ariel. The man approached the girl and said that it would not be easy, they had already reported to the Holy Kingdom about their return. Preparations for the ceremony and the appointment of a new saint were in full swing, so there could be no question that they were going to the Archduke. The girl said that it was the request of the King of Cilia himself and she had no right to refuse him. The man asked what the king had promised them in return. The girl replied that it was just gratitude that he allowed them to stay here. The man with a sad face said that the girl was right, they really could not refuse the king, in order to maintain good relations with Cilia, so he would contact the Holy Kingdom and report their delay. Ariel said they would leave right now to save some time. Due to the fact that people in this world have not yet learned medicine, Ray's first patient, whom he helped, instead of thanking him, made a commotion, so the guy was wondering what kind of person the second patient would be. They set off and decided to stop at sunset. Ray was sitting by the fire, the girls looked at him saying that he was much more beautiful than the rumors that go about him and decided to talk to him. One of the girls came up and asked if he needed help, the guy said that everything was fine. The girls asked permission to stay with him, they were very interested in watching him. Ray said to sit down comfortably and the girls sat down next to him, looking embarrassed. They turned out to be too talkative, so Ray decided to take a little break from them. It was very surprising that these young girls had so much energy. Then the guy heard a conversation about how the girls discussed him. One of them said that there was too much honor for such a kid. He was still a child who had not known life, who dared to set conditions for the kingdom. Another girl said that Ray was with the elves that dared to raise a hand to their saint and they can't forget about it. Ray stood behind a tree and listened to the mud being poured on him behind his back. The girl went on to say that upon arrival from this kingdom, it would reach all people that he was not a saint at all, but just a dummy. After that, an enraged Ariel approached, asking to repeat once again what the girls had just said. She put a lot of pressure on everyone asking for what purpose they discussed her, and the saint and how they ended up in their dialogue, after which she decided to take what she heard for the truth. The frightened man said that it was just a misunderstanding the girls were too young and stupid and did not understand what they were saying, so they probably wanted to say something completely different and then started shouting for everyone to apologize to the saint. Ariel was too angry at them and said that an apology would not be enough, because they dared to make fun of the saint just because he was still young, and also called him a dummy. The girl said that she would not let them get away with it, because the saint was chosen by God himself. Insulting the saint means insulting God's choice, so the date of the words were just blasphemy. 28th chapter. The girl apologized to Mrs. Ariel, admitting her guilt that they had no right to discuss the saint. Ariel shouted that they were not apologizing well enough, because they decided to doubt the chosen one of God, and now they can't even apologize properly. She whispered that there were people in the world who would like to apologize, but for them it was not permissible. Ray heard her whisper and realized that she was talking about herself. After all, in fact, being a saint at such a young age is a very heavy burden, because she knows the weight of her words like no one else. He also knew them, because he was a man who in a previous life was a brilliant surgeon. T. E. Guy decided that he should finally come out from behind the tree and said that it was unpleasant for him to hear this. He did not think that they had such an opinion about him, because he heard that they consider him a small child, as well as a dummy. They immediately began to apologize to him, saying that they did not mean it. 
Ray thought about it and said that they were not really wrong, since they thought that he would become a saint by being a dummy. Ariel said fearfully that he shouldn't talk about himself like that, he's not a dummy at all. The guy said that he didn't have divine power right now, so he had no idea how to prove himself in the Holy Kingdom. Even if God himself had chosen him, he would have been an ideal candidate for the role of a dummy, because everyone present thinks so. The girl said that they have nothing to consider him a dummy, God has his own plans for him. Ray replied that he did not say that God chose him for no reason. He was sure that there would be many people in the Holy Kingdom who would think the same way. And in this case, he would remain a dummy for everyone. Then Ray said that he wanted punishment for these people, and they continued to beg him to forgive them. He looked around and thought that there were other guys here who looked down on him, mistaking him for a dummy, as well as a small child, or thought that he was not qualified enough for this, so they might have been right in some way. They called him young because he had not gained enough confidence in himself, he had no power, abilities, connections or reputation. However, after a couple of years that he will spend in the Holy Kingdom, he will prove to them that they are deeply mistaken about him. He will make everyone who looked down on him and despised him regret what he said. Anyone who dared to offend him will then pray that he forgives him. Ray will leave them as witnesses to the promise made to them and will not punish them. But people continued to ask for forgiveness and repented of what they had done. The guy hoped that soon the day would come when they would regret even more than now. As long as he is on the territory of the kingdom and does not achieve his goal, he will do everything to raise the honor of the holy kingdom even higher. Ray didn't know how long it would take, however, he would do everything to make them regret today. Everyone stood and looked at how the guy was standing under the bright moon that illuminated his whole body and admired. After Ray and Ariel sat around the campfire, the girl continued to discuss his speech and he thought she was just mocking. The guy was warming up a stew on the fire, because the priest ate his portion, and after everything that happened, he got a little hungry. He offered it to the girl, saying that it tastes much better when it's hot. Ariel happily agreed. Then they saw a shooting star. The girl had not looked at the night sky so easily for a long time and it was at this moment that she was lucky enough to see a shooting star. In a previous life, Ray's name meant shooting star, unexpectedly for him. He had already forgotten that his name was that, he was so used to the name Ray. He told Ariel that where he comes from, they make a wish at the sight of a shooting star, and this wish must be fulfilled. The girl was surprised and immediately began to make a wish. After listening to Ray, the girl remembered the legend of their kingdom. They said that everyone who happened to see a shooting star would know a happy death. The guy didn't really believe it, because he believed that death could not be happy at all. Ariel didn't believe it herself either. After a while, Ray and Ariel went in a carriage to the estate. As they were in a hurry, they decided to go straight to the Archduke upon arrival in the duchy. Because they have very little time, they need to deal with the treatment as soon as possible and return to the Holy Kingdom. If they stay late, they will have problems. They arrived at the place, Archduke Silo said that when he learned about their arrival, he was very excited, but at the same time happy that they had come such a long way, for the sake of his daughter. Ariel said that it was all by the will of God, for the sake of the suffering. They came to grant her grace, because it is the duty of the saints, so do not worry about it. Silo apologized for the rush, but asked them to help his daughter as soon as possible, because for him her existence is a gift, and he cannot watch his precious child suffer. The girl said they would go to his daughter right away. Silos was very grateful and said he would do everything for them if they cured his daughter. Ray watched the dialogue and realized that the Archduke had a lot of faith in Ariel, even though she hadn't done anything yet. But he realized that it was all because, being a saint, she has divine power, and is a great person. The maid led the saints to Layla's room. What Ray and Ariel saw shocked them, they didn't know what it was. 29th chapter. Ray looked at the girl sitting up in bed. Part of her body was covered with red spots, he decided that these were erythematous papules, believing that this was a case of herpetiform dermatitis. The guy was thinking that the girl should have been treated even earlier so that she would not get into such a state. Salosa slightly covered herself with a blanket, thinking that she looked disgusting. Ariel came up to her and asked her to hold out her hand. The girl timidly stretched out. Ariel told her that everything would be fine now and began to heal her. A little bit of divine power, which with a huge light spread throughout the room, and the girl's skin was healed. The saint said that everything was fine, so the father should not worry about his daughter. The girl's father immediately hugged Layla and said that Ariel was really a saint, because his daughter had suffered so much for the last eight years and he had already lost hope, so someday he would repay her debt. Ray looked at it all and thought that at first it looked like a skin defect requiring long-term treatment. But the girl cured her only by touching the girl's body. Apparently medicine really does not make sense in this world. The Archduke prepared the best for them, although he still thought that this was not enough, and soon told them to start eating. Ariel told him that it wasn't worth it, it was much more than they could ask for and thanked him for the food. Lord Hopel, sitting at the table, said that according to rumors, he knew that the saint was amazing. But he did not even think that she was so merciful, so he would like to thank her from the bottom of his heart for treating his younger sister. The girl confusedly said that she was sure that his gratitude would do the best for their Lord Gaia. Ray sat silently at the table and listened. The Archduke turned to the guy and said that he considered him very laconic, so he asked maybe he didn't like the food. 
Ray said that the food was just wonderful, but he was silent because he was just thinking about something. After he apologized for making him worry, Ariel turned to the man and said that the saint has a lot of thoughts bothering him, so you should not worry about this. Ariel turned to Ray and asked what was going on. The guy replied that he was just tired. The girl said that they had agreed to stay overnight at the castle, so he could rest. Ray didn't understand why he shed so much blood and tears to become a doctor, even though he had memories of his former life. In this world, they were all completely useless. He really needed to forget about his past called Park Yusong and start living like Ray. He was in his room, Ariel knocked on his door and asked if he was sleeping, saying that he did not understand what was wrong with him. But asked him not to stop believing in himself, she understands that there are times when everyone doubts themselves, and hope that what is bothering. Him will not destroy what he has created, and also said that instead of worrying and exhausting himself like now, he should know that his usual prickly, but funny side suits him much more. The guy sat down on the bed and thought about her words, as well as whether he was really Ray, because he was still a former doctor of Park Yusong, so he decided to just find something that only he was strong in. The guy left the room, the girl looked at him and asked him not to give up, he said that her words were more appropriate than ever, so he was very relieved, and also said that her words sounded like she was comforting someone for the first time. The next morning, everyone found out that the girl's symptoms had returned. She was not completely healed, so they immediately called the saints. Ariel said that the treatment was supposed to heal her. She did not understand why the symptoms returned and said that she would try to heal Layla again. The Archduke said with hopelessness that everything was in their hands. Ray told the girl to wait and asked Layla to hold out her hand to him. The girl's father did not understand how the guy could heal what even the saint could not heal. Ray said that if what he was thinking was confirmed, then he was the only one who could cure her of this disease. 30th chapter. The Archduke asked Ray why he thought he was the only one who could handle it. Ray looked at the man and said that the saint could not cure her in any way. Of course they could ask the saint to cure the girl again, but they would leave, and the symptoms could return again. All that the girl needs is definitely not the healing of the saint. She needs to accept his treatment. The man said that he had heard that the guy had no strength and asked what he was going to do. Ray replied that his treatment does not require healing powers. He uses all the information he knows to get rid of this disease. He will do how he gets rid of diseases. The girl told her father that if they don't trust the guy, they are unlikely to be able to do something on their own. Because they have already tried, so they have no other choice. The man supported his daughter's words and trusted Ray. The guy promised to cure this young lady. From the next day, he began to look for the cause of this skin condition. The first was hygiene, as this is the most basic point of health, so he tried to test this option. But seeing how the servants wash blankets and clothes at least once a day, he decided to rule out poor hygiene as the reason. Given that the castle was protected by a magical barrier, it was unlikely that a parasite from outside caused this disease. However, he noticed one problem that arose because of her diet. There was one thing in common, because all the dishes that the girl ate every day were using flour. Not only was bread the most commonly consumed product in this world, even meat dishes, as a rule, were garnished with flour products. In addition to everything, her condition worsened after eating. That was the only clue Ray found. Flour contains insoluble protein, gluten, so the girl's disease was definitely dermatitis caused by sensitivity to gluten, which is also known as allergy. It is not difficult to treat. Unfortunately, the only problem was that there were no useful medicines in this world, because all of them were not effective enough. It would be difficult to try to make medicine from plants that the guy is unfamiliar with. Besides, it can take a long time and the only thing he can do is change the girl's diet. Ray wrote a list of foods that had to be removed from Layla's diet from that moment on and gave it to the servants. In the morning, the guy decided to check the girl's condition and went to her room. She immediately let him in. Her condition only got worse, he knew that her diet was the reason for it. Ray came up to her bed and told her personally that from now on he wants her to avoid foods that contain flour, as well as anything that looks like bread, and also sternly said that if her body itches, then in no case should it be scratched. It was all he could do for her. Layla was horrified by what she heard. She did not want to avoid bread, because it was her favorite food. She didn't understand why she couldn't eat him, thought he was lying to her and even thought she should call security. But she did ask him if he was going to do anything else, maybe use magic to heal her or something like that. But Ray told her that this was all her treatment. He was sure that it would help her cope with her problem, as well as get rid of all the blisters in the coming days. The guy will do it on his own, so he needs to check her condition. Then he wished her a good rest and left the room. Layla wondered if her condition would really improve if she did not eat bread and did not understand at all how this could be related. Outside the door of the girl's room, Ray was met by Ariel and asked about Layla's condition. He told her that the condition was getting worse. Ariel understood where this guy came from, but still thought that the girl would feel better if she healed her again on her own. Ray, looking at the girl, said that her healing method is completely useless and if they resort to her methods of treatment, 
Then everything will come back. Ariel doubted that the girl could get better from the fact that she would go on a diet that Ray had prescribed for her. But even if it helped Leela, she did not understand why he did not do so right away. Although she believed the guy a little, but the Duke thought completely differently. They could not stay in the estate for long and Ray realized this with sadness and looked at Ariel. The girl did not like his look, and she asked not to look at her like that, because she believed that she could not do anything about these circumstances. Ray thought that now it didn't matter at all whether he could cure Layla or not. It was important that it would depend on how he would treat his patients from now on. Therefore, I asked only one week from Ariel and said that I was absolutely sure that during this time the girl would be able to fully recover. The next day, Layla's scream could be heard all over the estate. 31st chapter. Ray tried to get the girl to drink water. She refused to do it with terrible screams. The guy told her that she hadn't even drunk the amount she should have. She needed to drink 3 liters a day. A total of 21 liters a week. This is the amount of water she needs to drink. The girl started crying and shouting that she did not want to do this, and also did not understand how water could cure her. Because it was not even holy water, so she did not see the point in such a large amount. The guy told her that water helps to cure allergies, so he asked her to trust him and drink a glass of water, because when foreign substances enter the body, a chemical created by the immune system called histamine is created. It is produced in response to protecting the body from foreign substances that enter the body, and in people with allergies, the chemical is produced in excess and can cause terrible consequences. When this happens, drinking enough water allows the body's cells to work properly. It can also reduce the effects of an allergic reaction. Therefore, this is the best way to treat. Therefore, Ray began to give the girl water on his own, pouring it into her mouth. The girl did not like it at all, and she did not understand what kind of saint he was, that he was doing this to her, considering him just a madman who came out with the face. And so four days passed. After Ray put her on a diet and forced her to drink a lot of water, the girl began to hate him. However, Layla decided to trust him, because she had no other choice. As a result, her skin really healed. She was on the men with incredible speed. The girl really got better after she drank a lot of water and stopped eating flour. She couldn't believe it herself. But Ray still understood that she was not completely cured and told her that they should continue treatment. Layla, seeing that it works without hesitation, agreed. Even though Ray was worried that people in this world would react differently than in his world, it seemed to him that he was worrying about it in vain. It was only a matter of time now, because when she was cured, everything should be fine. But he didn't think so for a long time, because on the sixth day they faced a huge problem. The girl beat the dishes with food and demanded bread. She started experiencing withdrawal syndrome. In this world, flour was the main product of the diet. For Ray, it was quite expected that the girl would break down and run for flour products. However, if she still uses flour products without completing the treatment, all the efforts of the guy will be in vain. To distract her, the guy needed to help her focus on something else and then she wouldn't think about bread. Ray decided to come up with a game and began to carve a chess piece with magic. Ariel watched this process, she was very interested in what he was doing. The guy gave her a look at the figure and asked what comes to her mind when she sees it. The girl began to look at it, saying that it reminded her of a castle, a holy kingdom, and it also looked like a crown. Ray decided that it worked and told her to follow him, and he ran to Layla and called Lord Hopal. He decided to show them that he could cope with Layla's withdrawal syndrome, saying that he would need help. He sat everyone down at the table and showed a board with figures, calling it chess and began to explain that each of them has his own army. The rules of the game were simple. All they had to do was capture the opponent's king by moving their pieces, and the one who would be the best to manage the troops would win. However, he also said that there are rules regarding how each of the pieces can move. He took the king in his hands and showed everyone saying that he can move only one field, like a true ruler, reducing his movements to a minimum. On the other hand, there is a queen opposite to the king, as long as she is not captured, the king can move as much as he wants. Ray said that in the same way each of the figures has its own rules and began to talk about everything. Lord was very interested in this game, because there were many variations of moves in it. He also considered it a rather complex system that would be useful in real military training. Layla was also interested and was sure that her father would like it too. Ray invited Ariel and Layla to play a game and sat them down at the table. Ariel gave the girl the first move. The guy really liked the fact that they were interested in the game and while the girl is involved in the game, she will be able to distract herself from addiction. The girls were playing a new game very enthusiastically. Ariel asked Layla to just give up because she considered herself a great player. In the end, the girl lost and Hopal asked the saint to let him fight with her. The girl decided that he wanted to avenge his sister, but said that she would accept any challenge and gave him the first move, saying that everyone would kneel before the might of the Holy Kingdom. At first, everything seemed even better than Ray had imagined. Ariel and Hopal started their game, the guy was not going to lose just like that and wanted to show the girl the power of their duchy. Up to this point, Ray thought it would be a good way to distract the girl from thoughts about flower food. 
However, an unexpected change of events occurred. Hopal immediately showed the game to Duke Silos, saying that it was a complex and ideal game in which one could evaluate one's strategic capabilities as a military commander and believed that since Ray had created such an ideal game, he was actually sent by God himself. After the Duke plunged into the game, the situation took on a strange current. The week they had agreed on was over, but no one said a word about it. Everyone around played chess and even made figures on their own. Chess was originally intended as a game that would help Layla distract herself and finish her treatment. But this game was able to capture the entire castle of Silos. 32nd Chapter The Duke called the saints to him. Thanks to Ray, Layla's condition improved in just one week. It was quite a short time. Besides, he created a game called Chess. The man could not believe that he was able to do such a thing at such a young age. He told the saints that Layla's condition had improved noticeably and thanked them for what they had done, because it was painful for him, as a father, to look at his daughter's condition, and also asked to be allowed to thank them for being able to free her from suffering. Ariel said that this time she did nothing and only the saint and his methods of treatment should be thanked. The duke told the girl not to belittle herself, but at the same time he agreed that the saint had done a great job. So as a sign of gratitude for his help, he gave him a ring that was given to the rulers of their territory when they saved the dwarves. Ray was shocked that the duke was ready to give him their family heirloom as a token of gratitude, because he would never be able to accept something so precious, but at the same time, deep down, he was insanely happy about it. The guy didn't want to accept the gift until the last moment, but the man insisted very much, so Ray put on a ring that surprisingly fit him. The duke was sure that the dwarves would be very happy to learn that this ring had come to the saint. The guy thanked him for such a precious gift, although he thought that he would not be able to accept it so easily anyway. The duke had heard that they were heading to the Holy Kingdom tomorrow, so he asked to be allowed to sponsor their trip and make it as comfortable as possible, since the road would be long. They definitely needed to rest before setting off, so he created comfortable conditions for them in gratitude for all their efforts. Night came. Ray was glad that everything worked out in the end, but he thought that the Archduke was too generous. He didn't really believe that he just wanted to thank them. There was a knock on the door, but they weren't expecting anyone, so they were wondering who it could be at such a late time. It was Mr. Hopal and Lady Layla, they heard that the saints were leaving, so they decided to come in. Hopal didn't even think about the fact that they could meet a saint and a saint who were mentioned only in books. They helped with his sister's illness, and created the game of chess, so he wanted to thank them for everything they did. Ariel was also glad that she met them, she was sorry that they could not stay with them for a long time, because great things were waiting for them ahead. Hopal invited them to a night picnic, there was a castle in the backyard, where there was an incredibly beautiful view of the night sky, so it would be unforgettable. Ray was delighted and said it sounded very interesting, so they agreed. Hopal and his sister went to prepare everything. Ariel laughed and said that it looked like a farewell party for them and she thought it was very nice of them. All she did was work for the good of the Holy Kingdom by scaring away the people around her, so she never had the opportunity to experience something like this. She thought that maybe she hadn't noticed how the world had changed, she had never felt such feelings before. When Ray first met Ariel, she was cold and went to her goal, while being incredibly cruel. But now the old Ariel was no longer there, she believed that the world had changed, but in fact she herself had changed, she had become different. They went to the backyard, where they were already waiting. Hopal said that this picnic might be a little modest, but they didn't need a big table, because the most important thing was the time spent together. Ray turned to Layla and said that when he left, she would also have to avoid flower products if she disobeyed. T.E. disease would return to her, because since her body reacts to chemicals, flower products were like poison for her. So it is very difficult to cure this disease, but if she if he can hold out like this for five years, then by that time the disease can completely recede. The girl was just terrified, she believed that she was cured and she was scared that she would not be able to eat flower products for so long. Hopal, smiling, said that he had prepared a gift for them, he was going to light up this area by conjuring a small firework with white sparks. Although it required a lot of mana reserves, considering that this could be the last time they saw each other, he wanted to do everything in his power. Ray decided to give them a gift, too, and pointing his finger at the sky, conjured a huge bright, multicolored fireworks, which all the servants, including the duke, saw from the windows. Layla thought it was just incredible, because she had never seen such a beautiful fireworks display before. Hopal was also surprised that Ray had achieved such a high understanding of magic and thought it was amazing, so he would never forget that night. The time that Ray spent there will really be remembered for a long time. Magic was a convenient tool for him, so he decided to give up personal aspirations. But in the end, he was able to understand that his methods of medicine worked. He was able to develop new relationships and create wonderful memories. The guy will travel until he heals as many people as possible. 33rd Chapter Finally, Ray and the saint headed to the Holy Kingdom of Taya. Although they had a long way to go, thanks to the Duke's support, they were able to safely continue their journey. 
The Saints squad knew that all the support was thanks to Ray, so they were grateful to him from the bottom of their hearts. As time went on, Ray was just building up a good reputation for himself. In just a couple of days, he had already gotten used to the tents. The aerial squad approached the guy, and the girl said that they were inspired by the game created by him. So they created several strategies for this game and if he is not busy, then they would like him to take a look at it, or even play. He agreed, but in return, he said that he would not spare anyone, especially newcomers like them. They were a little scared and felt a bad feeling. It was the beginning of a team chess tournament. Since no one knew that Ray had participated in the World Chess Tournament in the past, all seven players lost to him in four moves. That's how he set a record of victories without defeats, and the accompanying squad changed their opinion about him, admiring that he was invincible. And so another day passed on the way to the Holy Kingdom. One day Ray had the feeling that they had moved from their place, deciding that it was because they had come such a long way. Ariel had told him that once they left this neighborhood, the Holy Empire would be just around the corner. The ground began to shake underfoot. A crowd of orcs appeared on the way. Everyone took up positions and prepared for battle. Ray, seeing that everyone was fighting monsters, thought that they should be helped. Because this way they would be able to set off faster. But Ariel was sure that the warriors themselves should easily cope, and if they came out. Then everyone would have to change their positions to protect them, so this would only cause discussion and just cause more harm. One of the orcs picked up a huge stone and threw it at the squad. The commander of the forward squad, Hirio, did not expect that a simple ogre could be so strong and told the middle squad to reorganize to protect the saint and the saint so that the ogres would not pass to them. At that moment, the ogre wanted to hit the commander with his huge fist, but Ray quickly ran to him and created a shield. He thought that it would not make anyone worse if he came out. The commander was scared for the guy, saying that it was very dangerous here, but Ray said that everything was fine and noticed that the orcs were superior in strength, so he used triple magic using binding, earth spear and fire. The commander was grateful to him for blessing him with his protection and thought that the saint was young enough, so he did not understand how he was able to use such strong magic. Because he managed to use the fourth circle spell, the earthen spear, only with the help of a spell from words. So he also used binding and fire along with this, so he believed that Ray might have been a fifth circle magician or could even have reached the status of even the sixth circle of magic. Uriel called the saint and asked if he was trying to provoke rumors about what a genius he was to the whole continent with his actions. She also had a strange premonition, so she wanted to go on until the monsters united. But Ray smiled and said that it was too late, because the orcs had turned into little goblins. The commander could not believe that some goblins dared to stand in their way to the Holy Kingdom and told the squad to take care of them so as not to waste time. But the goblins were unexpectedly strong and repulsed the squad, injuring several people. Ariel realized that they still had no choice and decided that they should intervene. 34th Chapter The girl started fighting goblins. Ray, looking at her, thought that she was probably stronger than him in martial arts. One of the goblins rushed to the guy, but he was able to fight back. No matter how many they killed them, monsters still continue to appear out of nowhere. If they pull, they just won't cope with them. Ariel said that it would be good if it was possible to deal with everyone at once. Ray thought about these words and decided to try to do it, starting to tease the goblins. They immediately ran after him. There were a lot more of them than he thought. Ray wondered if he had taken them far enough away from the others and used the fireball spell. The monsters, seeing a small ball in his hand, began to laugh, thinking that this was all he was capable of. Ray smiled and scattered the spell on everyone, preparing a ball for each monster. There was a huge explosion. The squad noticed him and ran to the guy worrying about his safety. Ray came out of the smoke that was formed due to the explosion and said that they still have a long way to go, so they should hurry up and leave this forest, hoping that they will not meet any more monsters on the way. Evening came, Ray and Ariel were sitting by the fire. He wondered if all the monsters were as strong as the ones they face today. The girl replied that usually monsters are not so strong, so it was difficult for their squad to cope with them. After that, she told him that when he was baptized, his mana would disappear. Ray was a little scared that the mana would completely disappear from his body. The girl went on to say that if he was baptized in the Holy Kingdom, God himself would bestow divine power on him. And as you know, the human body is able to store only one type of power. Divine power has the same properties as mana, so if divine power enters his body and mana is present there, then most likely his body will not withstand it. That is why, before giving him divine power, the mana in his body will gradually be replaced with divine power. Ray was wondering what happens to people who don't have mana and what about magicians and their circles of power, whether they can keep them. He also asked about magicians who don't have magic circles whether they can get divine power. The girl replied that if there is no mana, then the divine power will fill the body without any problems. And if magicians do not have magic circles, then God will create vessels for mana in their body so that they can use their divine power, 
And as soon as this happens, God created vessels for mana, then what they are called golden chains, will control all the mana that circulates in the body. Golden chains is a term that was coined by the saints. They cannot go against the word of God, because they are not allowed to say or do anything that contradicts their faith. This is what is called golden chains. Because of this, they can't even talk about what they really think. The guy thought about it, because there are actions that contradict their taboo. He was wondering what would happen if these rules were violated. Iryo reminded that the golden chains control the mana in the body and said that if you break the rules, then all the mana in the body will disappear, and the person will disappear with it forever from this world. Ray didn't like that one extra word could destroy him, because it's pretty much a threat to anyone who dares to say what he wants. The girl said that few people disappeared in this way, but still you need to be on the alert to avoid it, and in any case, it's nothing for a saint, even though he will lose the mana that flows in him. Also, if mana disappears from the body, it's forever. But the divine power has its advantages, he may not be able to use magic, but he will be able to impose divine buffs on others, so he can be useful during the battle. Ray was very upset, he didn't want to lose mana, but at the same time he wanted to get divine power, so he decided to try to find a way to do it. The next day they were almost there. It took quite a while. Ariel told the captain to head straight to Salonia as soon as they crossed the border. Ray was not happy with the fact that they were heading straight to the capital. He did not want to perform the ritual immediately upon arrival. He did not even rest before that. Ariel smiled and said that they were not going to hold the baptism immediately upon arrival, because this ceremony, is a very important event that everyone celebrates. She also said that he still does not know anything about the Holy Kingdom. So he will have to get as much knowledge as possible before the ritual and said that she would teach him everything she needed on her own it is known. 35th chapter. They arrived at the place. No matter how much Ray looked at the mansion, he thought it was simply magnificent. It was a completely different level compared to the Silo's mansion. Ariel led him to the estate where all the saints live, it was a sacred place, even priests need to get permission to enter, even the people working inside were specially selected and had a status. She said that he needed to complete the training she had mentioned earlier within two days, and also reminded him that she would be his teacher. Ray didn't like it, and he wondered why the head of the mansion, who was supposed to be engaged in his training, suddenly became busy. A maid came up to them and greeted the saint, he immediately liked her charisma, she said she would take him to his chambers, so he needed to follow her. Ray, looking at the girl, recalled the words of Ariel, thinking that she should have some kind of status, because she did not look like an ordinary person. The girl brought him just into a magnificent room, which he really liked, told the guy to rest, and left him. Ray really liked this wonderful conversion, it amazed him. He felt that he was really becoming a saint. On the morning of the next day, Ariel started teaching the guy. They didn't have much time, but there was a lot to study, so he needed to focus and look at the materials she gave him. Ray was infuriated that the girl was so joyful. She was just about to start explaining the first page when Ray announced that he had already learned everything. He told her that the three-day baptism ceremony is divided into three main categories. The first is the welcoming ceremony, then the declaration of his sainthood, and the third, receiving divine power from God. Of these three steps, the last step takes place in a holy place with the saint in absolute isolation. During baptism, the saint should not lower his head and they are allowed to greet others only with their left hand, placing it on the upper part of the abdomen, at an angle of 70 degrees. And he also noted three basic rules of behavior at the table. The first is not to make any sounds while eating. The second is never to lower your head and the third is always to keep your back straight, and elbows should not go behind the trunk. Ariel stood in perplexity and did not understand how he could remember all this and whether he was a man after that. Ray was interested in the third part of the ceremony. He did not know what he would need to do. Because the materials did not say anything about it, the only thing he knew was that he owed his sincerity to God. So he asked Ariel to tell him about how she behaved during this. She said that she did absolutely nothing for this, only ate and slept all week, and after that, mana vessels appeared in her body and she felt divine power flowing through her body. She also said that despite the fact that he had learned everything, his manners left much to be desired. Because even if his memory was beyond human understanding, he could not learn the customs in any way, and memorizing everything and showing himself in action were completely different things. After that, she said it was time to have a snack and at that time she would personally test his skills in action. Ray sat straight at the table holding a fork in his left hand, a knife in his right and cut off a piece of steak. The girl looked at him in shock and realized that he was doing well, because she thought it would be completely different. But she still said that he still had a lot of things to work on, so she told him to put the appliances down. Ray put a piece of steak in his mouth anyway and said she was being too hard on him. Ariel yelled at him, saying that you can't talk with your mouth full, because annoying nobles will find fault with everything he does, so she will keep an eye on him during the entire training so that no one shames him later. The guy was extremely unhappy and wanted to send her to rest, but she said that she could not rest while he was in such a predicament, so she would have to stay here in life. A maid came up and turned to the saint, saying that the saint should not live in a mansion assigned to a newly minted saint because it could attract a lot of attention and lead to rumors about them. 
She apologized for her rudeness, but asked them to understand that she just shared her thoughts to avoid trouble. Ariel looked at the girl and asked what her name was. She introduced herself as Bella Kwasi Euclidwood. The saint, hearing what the girl said to Bellaria, remembered that this was one of the three noble families and did not understand why such an important person like her was chosen as a servant in the saint's estate. Within the Holy Kingdom, there are three noble families that the saints serve. In addition, there are also six families who have received the title of C, who are known for their achievements. Iriel told her that even though she was trying to smooth out the corners, she herself understood that she had to be very careful here and believed that. It was better for her to return to her room, also saying that she would remember her and thanked her for the advice. Ray, listening to the whole conversation, thought that since the girl has a title, it means she was from the noble and he was wondering why the noble work as servants. The status of a saint turned out to be much more significant than he thought. In the dead of night, Ray was sleeping sweetly in his chambers. Euclidwood came into his room and stood by his bed. Looking at the guy with her red eyes, she stretched out her hand to his face, then quickly turned around and left. 36th Chapter In the morning, the maid gave Ray tea. He really liked it, so the guy praised Euclidwood. The girl said that this tea was brewed using flower petals of Ceylon herbs. Last night, she entered the room so quietly that even Ray didn't notice. However, she didn't do anything, so the next day was as peaceful as possible. It's like she wasn't up to anything. Ariel was sitting across from Ray and watching the servants whisper. She considered the maid very suspicious. Euclidwood told the guy that everything was ready for the ritual and told him to follow her. He thought that they would start in the afternoon, but Ariel said that he still had a lot of things to prepare for the ritual, because he had to make a first impression on many people. He was dressed in formal attire and Ariel thought that he was very becoming to him, and also that no one would be able to take their eyes off him. A maid came up and informed him that everyone had already gathered, so she led him to the right place, where the Pope and the higher nobles were waiting for him. It was very exciting for Ray, but he had no choice, and he decided to at least get in first. The saint and the saint went inside. Two men saw the saint and wondered why he was so young, but they still approached him and began to get acquainted, saying that it was an honor for them, so they wanted to introduce themselves by holding out their hands to him. Ariel said that although they were happy to meet the saint, but it was clearly contrary to the rules of etiquette of the previous ceremony, and said that after the ritual, they would have a chance to congratulate him. The men blushed and said she was right. Euclidwood came up and told them to be more polite to the saint before the ritual, and also to avoid rude behavior. The men recognized the young lady from the Bellacroix family, but did not understand why she was wearing a maid costume. Ariel told him not to forget to say a few words about how he was preparing to officially become a saint, and also not to worry. Ray was outraged because it was the first time he had heard about it, he had not even been warned about it, although they could have told him in advance. Now he understood what she meant when she said that he would need to impress a lot of people. Ariel and Euclidwood started saying that he should just say what he feels, while remaining polite, because people will understand everything as they please, because they always do that and wished him good luck. Ray went out to the people and seeing a huge crowd, thought it was much easier to talk about it. Euclidwood told him to take a magic instrument that he needed to hold in his hand to make his voice sound much louder. Ray said he didn't need it at all. The girl did not want to upset him, but she believed that then no one would hear him. But the guy decided to use his magic and began his speech. He greeted everyone and said that he was pleased to see them here. After that, he introduced himself as a new saint named Ray. He said that God had chosen someone as young and inexperienced as him to bestow divine power, and also honestly admitted that he did not know what he needed to tell them. After all, he grew up as an ordinary little boy in a village near this city, and then he was elected a saint and promised something before coming to them. It was a promise to make the Holy Kingdom lead this continent. Therefore, he asked to be allowed to make this statement and make a promise to the people of this land. After he said that he was Ray and promised that the Holy Kingdom would be the strongest on this continent, and he was sure that people hearing this from such a young boy might find this bold statement a little funny. However, he said that as long as they believe and support him, he will do everything possible to help them all. He spread his hands, all the people froze, and then a huge stone fell from the sky. Everyone understood that this is the magic of the ninth circle, and only the highest magicians are capable of this. Everyone began to rejoice, calling the saint the supreme magician and greeting him. He cancelled this stone, and it disappeared, then asked Euclidwood what he should do next. She told him to follow her and asked him not to make such loud speeches next time. They came to the place, and she told him to lie down in a circle, and also told him that when he felt that he was spiritually ready, he should ask for a gift from God. Ray lay down, but he didn't know what to say to him at all. He closed his eyes and thought that he just had to greet God first. But when he didn't hear anything in response, he just started calling him. Then he abruptly opened his eyes, it was already evening. As it turned out, he suddenly fell asleep, and the so-called God did not even appear. His back ached from lying on a hard surface after spending the last couple of days in a good bed. He looked around and saw Euclidwood, who apparently stood like that all the time while he was lying down. He thought that the girl was probably tired, so he decided to get up for her sake and not at all because his back hurt. 
The girl asked him if God had answered his questions. Ray decided to pretend that everything went as it should and said that the voice of God would not leave his mind in any way. Euclidwood thought it was quite impressive, because even Lady Ariel took a whole day and said that he really was a saint. Ray wondered if he should tell her the truth, but he didn't. Unknown people stood and discussed that the appearance of a new saint would change all their plans. Their enemy was the Holy Kingdom and they should be careful when choosing the right moment. However, when the time comes, they will have to make sure that the Holy Kingdom falls. At any cost. 37th Chapter People were discussing the fact that Ray had already completed the ritual and it was very impressive to them. The ceremony was about to begin. The Marquis of Hellward personally insisted on this. Meanwhile, Marquis Hellward called his eldest son Barret and said that the Archmage is a saint who can summon meteorites, so he should lure him to his side, because this is their chance. They have lost a saint, so they must gain the favor of a new saint, and they must also strengthen their family's influence on the Holy Kingdom. So Barret must get along with the saint during the banquet, not forgetting to treat him with respect, regardless of his true age, and also make sure that he does not become his enemy. Barret said that there was no need to worry about it, because he had heard that Novi was a simple peasant saint. Barret and Count Grain discussed the saint, saying that he was a commoner and that he was really lucky that he was chosen and he was able to climb so high, because this is an amazing opportunity to change his life. Grain noticed Duke Trezik. Barret was just furious, because this guy had never appeared at banquets before and did not understand why he came now. But when he came up, he greeted him, saying that he did not think that people from Trey's family would be here. Zeke told him that he had not come to admire him. The Marquise of Krellian, Lady Sarat asked Zeke who he was considering. He was interested in the saint and asked if he was here. Barret replied that the saint would arrive soon and offered to wait for him together. But Zeke just turned around and left. Ray was changed. The clothes fit him very well, so he was comfortable in them, as if they were made based on his tastes. Euclidwood said she took the measurements on the day he arrived and sent them to the tailor, so she had to fit him perfectly. Ray was surprised that she was able to determine his size so accurately. She said that with enough practice, anyone can accurately determine the dimensions. The guy decided to compliment her, saying that at the first meeting he realized that she was amazing but for him she turned out to be much cooler than he thought. But the girl again did not react in any way, like a car, saying that she would take him to the banquet hall. Grain said he came later than he expected. Sarit thought that the guy needed time to dress up. Barit asked Grain if he had heard about what happened during the ritual and said that the new saint had inspired everyone with his speech, but still he considered him nothing more than a commoner. The arrival of the saint was announced. Everyone looked at him, some imagined him differently, he was very confident and calm, and for someone just perfect. Barit approached the saint and introduced himself as the eldest son of the Marquis of Hellward. Ray found out that he was one of the sons of the Hellward family and said it was an honor to meet him. Everyone started greeting him and introducing themselves the same way. Barit tried to catch Ray at least on one mistake, but he did everything flawlessly, as if for evil, which could ruin his plans. Barit told Ray that he had heard that he was a commoner and asked if it was true. Ray felt that he needed to strike back to prove himself, so he said that he was absolutely right. He was from a small village near the kingdom of Cilia. Barit decided that he was attending such a banquet for the first time, saying that commoners were not allowed to come to such banquets. Ray realized that they were trying to hurt him, but calmly replied that he was really for the first time at such a celebration. Because as the guy said, commoners are not allowed to such banquets. Barit smiled and said that the saints were not commoners, so this did not apply to him, and there was nothing for any mediocre people to do at such banquets. Ray thought that everywhere there are people like this Barit, who cannot come to terms with the fact that others have what they do not have. They cannot quietly and calmly look from the side, so they behave tactlessly and try to interfere in the affairs of others. Some people are even worse than garbage. There is one thing all these people have in common, they end up digging their own graves. So Ray decided to have some fun. The saint told Barit that apparently he believes that status defines a person and said that this is common sense, he is not used to such a life yet, so it is difficult for him to understand it. Barit said that everything was true, and also that he had already forgotten what they were talking about, then told Ray that he was a commoner in the past. But before he could finish the sentence, Zeke bared his sword and swung at Barit's shoulder from behind. But Ray managed to stop him with mana. The guy immediately screamed in fright. Ray was also not happy and said that it was a very dangerous action and it was good that he was able to stop the sword with mana. Zeke offered his sincere apologies and apologized for making such a bad first impression. But he could not allow Barit to humiliate the saint. He knew that this action was rude. But he could no longer restrain himself. Euclidwood came up and told Ray that what a guy from the Marquis of Hellord's family told him was blasphemy, because he dared to cross the line and make him look like a fool. Zeke said that this was true and he believed that they should execute Barit, thereby punishing the family accordingly, and this could serve as an example for everyone. Barit was horrified by what he heard. Ray thought about it and said to call the Marquis of Hellord. 
Euclid said she would call him right away, but Ariel said there was no need, because the Marquis was sitting and saw everything from the second floor. Florid immediately attacked his son, scolding him for what he had done, because he told him to behave with respect, and he disobeyed and treated the saint badly. 38th chapter. The Marquis, kneeling before the saint, offered his deepest apologies, saying that it was all because he had brought up his son badly and asked very much to forgive him for this rudeness. Euclid and Zeke, standing behind Ray, talked about how the guy needed to be properly punished. But the saint turned to Hellord and asked what punishment in such a situation could suit his son. The Marquis began to talk about how his son Barit lost his mother at a very young age. He had to raise him as a good father. Because he did not want him to have the kind of life he has, he wanted him to have a good life without flaws. This is a promise he made to himself. After he asked Ray to forgive his son for his unreasonable actions, he is even ready to give up his title and donate his fortune to the temple. Ray thought about the fact that the man was going to give up his title because of his son, and after all, if the sources of the water are clean, then the stream will be clean. He would have punished the Marquis of Haylord if he was the same as his son, but he seemed to him a completely different person. Therefore, I asked Barrett if he admitted his mistake, saying that his main mistake was that his father was on his knees because of him, and also that he was thinking about punishment, but because of his father's sincerity and great love for his son, he would probably close his eyes to it and forgives him. Everyone was surprised by the saint's words and considered him very merciful, because he let it go so easily. But Ray said he would do it if the Marquis donated money, as mentioned earlier. Ariel thought that this was too easy a punishment for someone who blasphemed so much and hoped that Barrett really thought everything over and accepted his mistakes. They came, Ray was walking in the garden. Zeke followed him everywhere and asked if he was sure that they should be forgiven, also saying that if he gave an order, he would take care of them immediately. Zeke chased the saint all the way, and the guy thought it was strange that he didn't pay attention to it. Then remembering that, he never asked his name. Zeke immediately fell to his knees and began to bow, saying that he had committed a huge sin and called himself Tracy Zeke from the Trey family. Ray was surprised that he also had C after his last name, because this is the title and people who have C in their name, three families who serve saints. But he did not understand why this was so important to many people. He did not think that three families should serve him, because it even sounds funny. Euclid said that this is a tradition from ancient times that no one breaks. Zeke asked him not to feel burdened because of this, because this is only the will of God. He also said that if he thinks that three families are too much for him, then he asked him to choose one, because he is ready to do everything in his power. Ray looked at Euclid and Zeke and asked what about the third family, because there were only two of them. Euclid said that the remaining family ensures his safety from the shadows and their real identity is not even known to the Holy Kingdom and they also do not know who they are. But in any case they know that they are always there to protect the saint. The saint heard a rustle and raised his head up when he saw that someone was sitting on a tree. The girl was right, they were actually nearby and now that Ray knew about it, he could feel their mana and determine where they were, counting seven nearby. The girl who was sitting on the tree realized that the holy magician and she was very impressed. In the morning, Euclid stood in the corridor and recalled her childhood, how her father prepared her to protect the saint. She fell and was injured, but they told her that if she did not try hard enough, she could not bear the name Belacroix. There has never been a case of two saints existing at the same time. Given that there is already a saint, there should not have been saints in this generation. However, in order to serve a saint who did not even exist, she had to suffer, and she asked a hundred times a day if she should do it. But years later, God answered her question by choosing another saint. Ray approached Euclid, saying that Ariel would lead the next ritual and asked what that meant. Smiling, Ariel reminded him that she had said several times that the ceremony would be conducted by a divinely beautiful woman. Euclid decided to explain to him that, except in special cases, only saints can enter the ceremonial hall and this has nothing to do with appearance. They went out into the woods and Ray enjoyed being outside, talking about how nice it was here and he didn't even know there was a forest here. Ariel led him to the right place, there were guards and a huge staircase, which scared Ray terribly. Ariel said that they just had to go up all the way, and also said that this part of the ceremony was intended to show his respect to God and he was strictly forbidden to use magic. 39th chapter. They started up the stairs. Ray asked Ariel to stop and take a break. The girl said that they had just started, and he was already tired, believing that he had problems with endurance. The saint said that it was because he had been walking around the kingdom all day yesterday, and if he could only use magic there would be no problems. She said that from now on he should not use magic at any ceremony. This is also unacceptable. After all, he has to go all the way by himself following the stars, and he will be able to get there. Then I decided to repeat once again that he should not use magic and was sure that he would cope. After a while, Ray looked back and realized that he had come very far and could not give up. Finally he was able to get to the very top, it took much longer than he expected. He looked ahead and saw a house in front of him, although he thought that there would be a completely empty area, but he was glad that this was not the case. Going into the house, the guy thought that he was going to spend a week here, and Ariel also said that he needed to show respect to God, but he didn't even know what he needed to do. Ray was very happy because he considered it a kind of vacation, 
deciding to rest here a lot, also believing that the week would pass quickly. Only then did he not know about the trials that awaited him and the harsh reality that he had to face during his stay here. The guy walked around the house and picked apples, promising himself not to use mana, and do everything with his own hands. But he had no idea how he could survive here and did not understand why no one told him anything about it, thinking that his suffering was not enough for them. They told him to stay here for a week, saying that it would not last more than one week, but he had been there for a month, not knowing what was going on at all. He also thought that they had decided to make a savage out of him and had already sent the thought that he wanted to be a saint. Then he felt a strange feeling, thinking that it was because he was angry, but finally he received divine power. But this power appeared and disappeared, as if God was playing with him. The guy thought it was nonsense because he suffered here for a whole month, and the force did not appear normally. Ray decided that he had had enough and wanted to leave, but the force stopped him. This was even more annoying because he felt the air around him filled with divine power, but suddenly it dissipated as if it had never existed. He had never been so upset, it seemed to him a very cruel joke. He really wanted someone to comfort him. And then he heard someone call him, looking back, he saw Ariel. Despite the fact that the first person he met a month later was her, he was still very glad to see her. She asked him if he could use magic at the same time as the holy power, he said that he had not tried to use magic yet, the girl said that the ritual was over so he could try. Ray looked at Ariel's clothes and asked what was wrong with her, she replied that she felt a strong divine power, and hurriedly ran to him. Since all her clothes were dirty, he decided to try a cleansing spell on her, it worked, Ray felt very relieved that he could still use magic. But the guy thought that he could use mana floating in the air, but he could not use divine power. Ariel was very sorry that he could not use divine power, however, she said that he remains the one chosen by God and an incredible magician, and if someone dares to say something to him, then he can just use magic against him. Then she noticed that the air around became very pleasant and delicious smell, and decided that it was because of the divine power. Ray didn't really like that the girl was sniffing him and decided that he needed to stay away from her until he learned to control his power. But Ariel considered the fragrance very warm which made her want to be near him. Zeke and Euclidewood came to their meeting and congratulated Ray on the end of the ritual, saying that he had done a good job and started arguing about who would carry the saint's backpack. Ray didn't like it at all, and he just wanted to get back to the mansion as soon as possible. Oh. All the way there, Zeke was chasing Ray, which really pissed him off. But the guy said that he, as a member of one of the three families, is obliged to serve him anywhere and anytime, so he will never change his principles, and also he will never have bad intentions. Ray returned to the mansion. When he became a saint, he promised himself to make the holy kingdom the greatest. Since he has now officially become a saint, he needs to fulfill his promise and first of all he needs to learn more about the kingdom from the history of climate and agriculture to commercial industry. To understand all this, he had to take up books. And in order to elevate the Holy Kingdom, he must create a new system. 40th chapter. As soon as the sun rose, Ray summoned all the nobles of the Holy Kingdom. He criticized the assembled nobles for the inefficiency of their work, so in this regard, he proposed adjustments for agriculture, commerce and trade. Among these adjustments was the Milpa solar system for the agricultural industry. He received overwhelming support from the nobles, and the first technology was approved. Count Grain did not understand what it meant to use priests as mercenaries among the things that were written by Ray. The guy said it was all about sending priests as mercenaries. He suggested sending priests into battle. Grain said that the death of priests would lead to the fall of the nation and, in addition, the number of people seeking to become priests would decrease. Ray said that they would stand in the rear of the battle and while the wounded on the fronts were brought to them, so they could avoid casualties among them. The Marquis thought it was very dangerous. Ray agreed that the battlefield is not a safe place at all, but with a good strategy, all the priests will return to their families alive. He does not think of sending them to battle without a plan, and there will be paladins next to the priest and with this arrangement, they will be completely safe. But using priests as mercenaries is a different strategy and if they win without interference, then it will be good. And if they lose, there will be a safety net. Ray believed that it would be a very good experience for the priests to see those who were wounded on the battlefield and witness what was happening up close. Grain decided that priests were really a necessary force in battle, but he hoped that there were other options, because everything was for the sake of victory, getting money and fame. Ray said that using priests is not just money in their honor, it's just a nice bonus, because they will send priests to the battlefield, and in return they will receive power. From the point of view of the peoples who need the help of the Holy Empire, they cannot do anything that could endanger them and as long as they occupy their troops to them, they will be able to ask for compensation for the sacrifices incurred on their part. Grain thought that they would really be able to gain more control once they started allocating forces, but he still considered it very dangerous. Despite the risk, Ariel thought it was a good idea and completely agreed with the saint. In her opinion, all the saint's ideas were just great. Nevertheless, she was sure that the idea of mercenaries would cause some negative reaction. 
Ray asked her if they could somehow gain the favor of the nobility. The girl said she could help with this and they did not need to win favor. After all, they can just overcome it and all she needed from Ray was the words oh, the most beautiful girl in the holy empire. Please help me, Lady Ariel. Ray thought that the influence that Ariel had was extraordinary. He thought it would not be an exaggeration to say that all the high-ranking nobles were supporters of Ariel. And if she helps him in this situation, it will be difficult for everyone to object. It was the best way out, since he had no other ideas. The saint made a speech to the people again, asking the people if they had any ideas regarding the promotion of the Holy Kingdom. People thought his ideas were very good and agreed with him completely. The Holy Empire slowly improved its fields of activity. It was difficult to completely change the method of introducing agriculture, so they started with a small plot of land for the sake of experiment. Also, the public was not against the use of priests as mercenaries. And after they received consent from the priests themselves, many asked them for help from hired priests. Thanks to this, the Holy Kingdom has raised a lot of funds. And as a result, his ideas related to rural activities and commerce allowed the Holy Kingdom to rise. Despite the fact that everything is going more or less in order now, they will still need specialists for various fields. This will be a difficult task, Ray needed time to think about everything carefully. Lady Eclat returned and decided to go to the library. To her surprise there were too many people there, which was not there before, it's only been three months since she last appeared here, but during this time so much has changed. The librarian said that the saint has been visiting the library for several days, apparently the girls fell in love with him, so they also began to visit the library. The girl was interested in this, so she decided to go to the guy. He was spending his time behind a mountain of books as usual, when she approached him, he did not know who she was and why she was addressing him. Eclat took one of the books and after examining the others realized that all the books were devoted to medicine, and did not believe that the guy could not read them all, much less understand something from them. But Ray calmly replied that he understood almost all of these books. The girl decided to play a game by asking the guy questions, in one of which she asked him to tell him how to treat a cut from a rusty knife. The saint replied to her that it was possible to prevent the symptoms of poisoning by using holy medicine, and then it would heal early. The girl said that the answer was correct, but asked if he agreed with it, to which the guy replied in denial, so she asked what he would do to cure the patient. Ray said that he would make an incision around the place of infection of the flesh, explaining that everyone thinks that cutting yourself from a rusty sword is tantamount to poisoning. But you can't say that because no one will be sent from a rusty sword. But infection can penetrate around the place of the cut in the cage. So it's impossible to perfectly cure it using holy healing, so it will be better to remove the infected area around the cut and cure the area itself. The girl realized that she was losing in this game and asked about the cells that he mentioned. Ray forgot that people in this world don't know about cages yet. Yet the girl decided to move away from this issue by saying that cutting out the affected area, in her opinion, was too barbaric a method. But at the same time she believed that this was the best way out of the situation. Then she said that she liked him and invited him to her laboratory, deciding that they could talk about everything there. After that, the girl apologized for forgetting to introduce herself and gave her name. When Ray heard her name, he was shocked, because she manages priests, and is the high priest. 41st chapter. Eclat says that despite the fact that she and Ray met for the first time, the girl had heard a lot about him. She says that if he needs help related to medicine, he should turn to her, although, to be completely honest, she does not understand why saints study useless medicine. However, judging by the huge amount of medical literature, the girl is also studying it. Suddenly she lifts her hair from her forehead and says that she is studying medicine in order to help herself cure a long-standing illness. Ray finds out that she has been sick since birth. The girl says that she does not feel pain, but she still cannot see, then the hero offers to look at her eye a little closer. Looking at the eye, he realizes that it is a cataract. The hero also learns that Eclat sees better in the dark than in daylight. After learning about this, the hero is sure that it is a cataract, so he decides to tell the girl in more detail. The hero draws a diagram on the board and explains that he drew the pupil, and then the lens. When a girl looks somewhere, the lens focuses on the light, thereby allowing her to see better, but in her case, the lens is clouded. This disease is called cataract. The power of healing does not help cure this disease, because she was born with it already. Since the divine power eliminates disorders in the body and heals them, it does not accept congenital diseases as disorders. It is for this reason that she is unable to heal. From the point of view of other people, the fact that she sees only one eye is a violation. However, since she was born like this, the body does not understand that something is wrong. But in any case, the girl should clean her lens to cure cataracts. To clean it, you need to cut out the problem area. Then Eclat falls into a real horror, because Ray offers to cut out her eyes. Unfortunately, this is only part of the operational process, that is, it is necessary to first get rid of the clouded lens, and then replace the lens with something else, although it can simply be removed, because there is no artificial lens in this world. The hero thinks, because even if you get rid of cataracts, it makes no sense, because the girl will still not be able to restore her eyesight. 
Deniclat says that you should not worry about her illness, because she is sure that a couple more years and the hero will find a way. Hearing this, Ray is outraged, because she wants to say that she will not be able to cope with this disease. He calls Eclat and tells her that he will definitely help her, which makes her laugh unbearably. Then the girl calls the hero to follow her, because she wants to show him something. They come to her lab. This laboratory was founded by the Holy Kingdom so that Eclat could study medicine. She lets Ray feel at home and take anything, because she's lonely here anyway, and that's the least she can do for someone who is interested in medicine. After that, Ray began to study Eclat diseases. And a month later, holding the troll's blood, he argues that after contact with the air after a short period of time, the blood changes its consistency, becoming hard, like a piece of jelly. The blood of different monsters has its own characteristics, therefore, from a medical point of view, it can be useful to heroes. However, it is impossible to mix the blood of different monsters with each other due to the different composition, but there is one exception. Unlike other species, in the case of trolls, because of their great adaptability, they can be mixed with other blood, then Ray wonders if he can somehow check it. After a while, he will leave the laboratory, he collects useful herbs, but suddenly he meets an orc and a troll. Suddenly he notices that one of the monsters is alive, but bleeding. The orc survived a battle with a troll that is twice his size. Ray realizes that this is the perfect chance to test, so he decides to take advantage of the moment and save the orc. Suddenly, the orc regains consciousness and begins to move, then Ray uses stupor in a panic. He tells the monster to calm down, because he is not going to kill him, but on the contrary wants to save him. The monster lost a lot of blood, so he poured him some from the troll, but he woke up too quickly, so the hero did not have time to finish. Suddenly the hero sees that the blood has acquired a transparent shade. It turns out that she was cleansed, so the hero is sure that he will definitely succeed. 42nd Chapter The hero realizes that when he transferred the troll's blood into the orc, it became clean and pliable enough to use. He is surprised, because mixing the two types can lead to such a result. Therefore, with the help of such manipulation, he will finally be able to create an artificial lens and cure a he understands that now he needs to get as much orc and troll blood as possible, but where can he find so much? Eclat says that there is an abandoned village nearby, near the walls of the kingdom. She had heard that there were places nearby in the surrounding forests where both orcs and trolls were quite common. After a while, at night, the hero comes to this village and discovers ruins from the former village of Hegel. He thinks that Eclat was exaggerating, but the village is really abandoned. Suddenly Ray notices two small children at the wreckage of a building. The hero approaches them and offers them a snack. He also says that everything is fine with this food and it is absolutely safe and not poisoned. The hero decides to help them by giving them a bag of silver and gold coins. He says that they should spend this money on the road to Salonia, and there they will be able to provide for themselves and find food. Then the boy asks why the young man is so kind to people he sees for the first time. Ray replies that he doesn't need a reason for this. After a while, the hero comes to a huge cave. It was a troll's cave. He says that you need to be extremely careful and try not to wake up the monster. He brings a syringe to the monster and says that he needs to steal something a little. Then he comes to the settlements of the orcs and asks them to do him a favor, which causes the wrath of the monsters. The hero stops the attacking orcs with the capture and suddenly notices a familiar comrade whom he recently saved. The hero asks to do something for him, and in return he pays for their services with the meat of the animals lying behind him. The hero returns and says that thanks to the orcs, he successfully tested some things, and then, as he returns back, he will need to use what he collected. Suddenly, a girl stops in front of him, who he recently helped. She points to one side in tears and asks for help. Her older brother was being beaten in that direction. The bandit said that the boy should have given the money to him right away when he politely asked. The young man shouted at the offenders, and then they tried to attack him, but Ray stopped the gun with his hand. The hero realized that this man had stolen money. The bandits see that the hero is very rich, so they surround him to attack. One of them will attack the hero from behind, but Ray hits back with his fist, which causes the opponent to immediately lose consciousness. The bandits all at once began to attack the hero, but were defeated. After the victory, Ray approaches the children and apologizes for what happened. 43rd Chapter After a while, Ray comes with the children to the place where he lives, but the girl says that this is a holy place where only saints and their servants can live, and they don't know who these children are, so they can't let them in. Ray understands that there are very strict rules in this place, but he tells the children not to worry, because he will be able to find them another place in which they can live. After a while, standing on the street, the hero introduces the children to their new home in which they will live. Then he asks about their names, to which the boy replies that they are not. Then Ray comes up with names for them and says that the girl will be called Mary, and the boy, Chris. Suddenly the boy begins to cry, because he does not know what to say to this, because he is very grateful to the young man. Soon the hero continues to work on the medicine for Eclat. Finally, he completes his business. Eclat does not understand why the hero is still trying to cure her eye, because it is unlikely. The young man replies that he knows how to help her. He shows the girl a clear liquid and says that it is the blood of a troll, but mixed with the blood of an orc. 
As Eclat said, orcs are able to adapt to everything, unlike other species, although he found out about it by pure chance. But as long as the orc's body can accept blood, then in the process it becomes pure. Heroes can produce transparent blood so that it is pliable enough for manipulation. Now Ray needs Eclat to trust him. He shows what he has done and says that he needs to put it in her eye to further heal it. Eclat does not understand what Ray is trying to achieve, because earlier he said that he was going to cut out cataracts, but now he says that he is going to cure this disease with the blood of monsters. The hero replies that, technically speaking, they cut out those parts of the lens that were affected, and then insert an artificial lens as a replacement for what was cut out. Ray understands that Eclat needs time to think, because she still could not even imagine that such a thing could be possible. Suddenly the hero bows his head, which causes a shock to the girl, because a saint should not do this. Ray says that he understands that it is difficult for her to trust him, because it all sounds unreal and impossible, but he asks the girl to trust him, because he will do everything possible to cure her eye. Eclat feels sincerity in every word of the hero. He is going to cure her eye and from his mouth it sounds convincing. In the end, she agrees, because this is the last hope for the cure of her illness and if there is even a small chance of success, then she will seize on it. After a while, the operation begins. The hero uses mana to open the patient's eyelids, and then, making an incision in the lens, he removes the affected areas. After hitting the entire affected area, it is replaced with an artificial lens. Although the procedure itself is not complicated, but there is no professional equipment in this world. However, it is not difficult for Ray to do all this manually, because he is Shin Yusong, who is called the Hands of God. After a while, Eclat comes to her senses and, looking out the window, begins to cry from the fact that she can finally see. At this time, a man runs to the saint and says that a large army has gathered on the border, which is moving towards the Holy Kingdom. But it seems that the army is not from any particular nation, because this army was called by a necromancer, and now a horde of undead is coming to the Holy Kingdom. First chapter. The story began in the walls of the university auditorium. Freshmen sat in the hall and listened attentively to the man on the stage. A man under the spotlight congratulated the guys on entering their university. The event looked very solemn. There was a deathly silence in the hall. Everyone listened attentively. The man's speech was very pathetic and mysterious. He praised the guys because they had to go through a very tough competition to get here. He called them important people who will be able to protect our society in the future. While the man was making his speech in front of a large audience, one of the girls was desperately trying to make it to the event. A sweet-looking girl came into the classroom. When a man was talking about the conformity of the changing zeitgeist of their university, the girl froze in the doorway when she suddenly heard her name. Two men sitting nearby were whispering to her. Seo Yoon, as soon as she noticed the guys, immediately went to them. Sitting next to her, the girl asked if she was too late. One of the guys hurried to reassure her that everything was fine. The event had just begun. The other kid in the red hoodie clearly did not express any interest in everything that was happening. The man on the stage announced that next there would be a congratulatory speech by the vice president. The guy in the red hoodie and with dark hair was clearly very bored. He said he thought it would be like a party. After all, this is a welcome event for first-year students. Usually American children have a lot of fun at such events, eat and drink. His friend sitting nearby sighed reproachfully. They tried to explain to the guy in the red hoodie that this is a university, and it's not allowed here. Suddenly Seo Yoon asked what happened to the strict kid. The guys did not immediately understand what she was talking about. Then the girl hurried to explain that she was referring to the guy who was interviewed with them at law school. At that moment, the surprised guys realized who they were talking about. Han Young Hoon, who the girl was talking about, couldn't come here. Seo Yoon, hearing this, sighed heavily. The girl sat in perplexity because his average score was close and it was strange that this was not enough for admission. So Juno seemed very good, it's a pity that it turned out that way. At that moment, the guys pulled her away, no, but Jiang Hoon passed. They explained that who else would have come here if not him. He just couldn't not come here. And his absence from the event was explained simply by the fact that he did not have the opportunity to come here specifically. The girl was overwhelmed with joy at this moment. She began to behave impulsively exclaiming, how is it, why you didn't come here? It was clear from the girl's behavior that she liked him very much. She was sorry that he was not there, because there were a lot of explanations today. Although the guys agreed with her, they explained his absence with quite logical things. He was always repeating the same thing, so it was obvious he just didn't have any money. The guy was sitting on the floor, leaning on the bed, looking at the phone. He was clearly not in the best of spirits. Thoughts were spinning in his head, and he reflected that the whole situation was more like being forced to pay a fee for participating in just nothing. He sighed heavily and lowered the phone. Young Hoon understood that there are many different people in the world, many of whom are spending money, just completely wasteful. The guy thought that all people who spend more than 7,000 won a day are just dangerous. Young Hoon collapsed and collapsed face down on the bed. The guy was saddened, he suffered in turmoil. He lay there and wondered if he could pull this law school. Young Hoon clearly doubted his abilities, because this is the best Korean university. The guy understood that a legal exam was waiting for him after graduation. 
The next moment, the guy was lost in memories. He always realized that he was pretty smart, even though he was ashamed to admit it to himself. One day, when he was in class among his peers, he received a message. Young Hoon was blown up, he couldn't hide his joy. The guys around him were very surprised by his behavior. The guy shouted in amazement that he had passed, he was able to pass this stupid exam. It so happened that in the last year of study, the guy was able to pass the entrance exams to the best Korean university. The realization made him sweat, and his eyes seemed to disappear. After that day, he had a chance to finally get out of this terrible poverty. The guy was happily returning home. His thoughts were grandiose. He walked and imagined how he would first be able to find a tutor by selling Korean university products. He had peace of mind, because all his studies at the university were covered by a scholarship. While the guy was walking down the street, he dreamed that after studying he would be able to work in your company. But all his thoughts were just a dream. The real world turned out to be much more cruel. The difficulty of finding a tutor, a very big pursuit of grades, all this constantly put pressure on the guys. Many could not stand it, because even getting excellent grades with pluses, they felt like they were losing their position. Many people didn't care how smart you were and how well you studied diligently. In this terrible world, it was not your success in the financial world that was much more appreciated, but simply the position of relatives. Many used just the big names of their daddies, rather than trying to learn and earn good characteristics. The hierarchy in this world is much stronger than Jung Hoon imagined. All the possibilities that were constantly around turned out to be just an ordinary fiction. The guy felt like he was at the bottom of a dried up river. There were huge rocks all around him. But he was too determined, it didn't matter to him that every time someone tries to frame him. He knew that even in this case, he would still do his best to get out. When Young Hoon returned home, he had a difficult conversation with his father. His father was sitting across from him at the table. His tone was clearly not the most friendly, he did not understand what kind of law school it was. The guy tried to explain that it was like a law school. If he finishes his studies, he will be able to become a judge or prosecutor. Yes, even with the lawyer himself. The father continued to press and ask all sorts of questions. The guy explained that this school is the only way to a normal life. At the end of it, he will have to take a lawyer's exam which meant, subject to successful delivery, a great start into the future. The father thought for a few seconds and looked at his son carefully. He nodded approvingly and put the papers on the table with understanding. At the moment when the boy was finishing school, his father closed the supermarket, which he had run for 20 years and returned to his hometown. The paper that was lying on the table was a certificate of all the deposits, benefits, pension funds that my father had accumulated over his entire life. The guy went berserk, he shouted that he didn't have to do all this. He understood that his father had sold everything in order to give this money to his son, because education is quite expensive these days. The guy jumped up from the table and tried to prove that the student loan system is pretty good these days, so he can take out a loan. He will simply say that it is for attending law school, and the bank will definitely approve. His father strictly stopped him. The tension in the room had reached its limit. The father sternly, looking at his son, tried to explain to him that in no case would he allow him to wallow in debt before he even joined society. Young Hoon looked at his father in confusion. After that, he hit the bed with his fist with rage. Waking up from the memory, he realized that there was no point in worrying about it now. The next second, he heard the vibration of the phone lying on the table. When he picked up the phone, he saw that his father was calling. The guy immediately answered the phone, but it wasn't dad at all on the other side of the line. The paramedic of the 119th ambulance greeted him. After clarifying that Mr. Tsong Khan's son was talking to him, the employee continued. The man said that his father was hit by a car. The culprit fled the scene of the crime, which is why the father was found so late. Young Hoon's hands began to tremble treacherously. An ambulance employee said that now the father is being taken to the university hospital, but the situation is difficult, so he needs to have an urgent operation. Doctors needed the approval of a family member or guardian. Young Hoon didn't even let the employee finish, he jumped to his feet and said that he was moving out immediately. The guy experienced a lot of stress, his hand trembled treacherously throughout the entire bus ride. Arriving at the scene, he sat in the surgery department from the very morning until late at night. He couldn't move from excitement. He just sat in one place for many hours, his thoughts were constantly confused. Soon the guy couldn't stand it and approached one of the nurses. Politely addressing, he tried to explain that his father is now in intensive care, and he really wants to check his condition. The girl tried to explain to the young man in a polite voice that it is impossible to visit the intensive care unit outside the visiting time. The guy sighed heavily and explained that, of course, he knows these rules, but at least he wants to know if his father is sleeping. The girl looked at the guy sympathetically. She couldn't even imagine what hellish pain this young man was experiencing right now. Although she wanted to help him very much, but rules are rules. She pointed out that Young Hoon has been here for a very long time, and he should go home to get some rest. The guy with a tremor in his voice tried to explain that everything was absolutely fine, he felt great. The girl was categorical and said she would contact him if the patient wakes up. In a terrible state, the guy came back. It was already dawn outside. As he approached his father's new house, he caught himself thinking that this was only the second time he had come here. 
there was an electronic password on the door. It was not difficult to guess it, because the password is the date of birth of Young Hoon. The guy entered an empty, dark room, but there were family photos on the shelves. Young Hoon came over and took a photo of them together with his father from the shelf. He looked at the framed photograph with concern in his heart. The guy stood and thought about what would happen next, whether he could live without his father, whether he could live if his only family disappeared. Will he succeed further, continue to study, dream and live his daily life? A lot of memories came into my head. He remembered his father's voice, he remembered that he was always proud of him and said that he would believe in him no matter what. The father knew that his son was very strong and could overcome everything in the world. Remembering the words of his father, Young Hoon, sitting on his knees, doubted everything. He was no longer confident in his abilities. The guy was deeply depressed, there was unbearable pain on his soul. The light behind his back was able to distract him from his mental agony. The guy turned around and walked over to the pile of his father's things lying on the floor. Stopping by, he froze in amazement. Bending down, he picked up a strange artifact that emitted a bright glow. Young Hoon stood in amazement. He couldn't understand how his father's thing turned on by itself. He twisted, turned this strange object could not figure out how to turn it off. The next moment, he pressed the button at the bottom of the object and the unthinkable happened. The arrow of this strange mechanism began to rotate. The guy was standing, wondering what all these things were doing at his father's. Why all this collection at all? After that, something happened that is generally difficult to explain in principle. The glow of the object became such a force that it filled the entire room. The guy tried to cover his face with his hands and did not understand what was happening. Suddenly, the space began to distort, and he fell into the abyss. The next moment, the guy was in a place he didn't understand. He was dressed in the strange clothes of ancient ages. Trying to recover, he remembered what it was. Bright light, that's all he remembered last. Before the eyes of the guy was a terrifying picture. There were many clouds of black smoke in the sky, fire everywhere. He was standing on the deck of a large ship. There was a vast ocean around him. Many ships near burn with bright flames. There was a smell of burning and gunpowder in the air. Fear froze on Young Hoon's face. The guy looked at everything in amazement, not understanding what was happening now. The next moment, an arrow flew into the guy's side. A wave of pain immediately passed through my body. The guy collapsed to the floor, the soldiers next to him were trying to find out if everything was okay. The next picture did not fit in my head, arrows flew like hail. The guy was experiencing hellish pain in his eyes, it began to get dark. He didn't understand what had just happened to him. He touched the arrow, there was blood on his hand. Young Hoon looked at the whole picture in horror. As if arriving, in some kind of trance, he heard the soldiers shouting out of the corner of his ear. Second chapter. Young Hoon continued to lie on the ground and listen to the soldiers' conversations. The warriors wondered how all this could have happened. According to them, the frontline ships had to observe the movement of the enemy. But clearly something went wrong. Rumors began to spread that they had already attacked and managed to destroy everything. Two soldiers were arguing bitterly. Many wondered why the order was not received. But it was clear that if this went on, their ship would also be destroyed. A serious-looking samurai turned to another warrior. He tried to explain that they were clearly not in a position to wait for an order right now. He clearly understood that if they didn't do something now, they would all die. Man Ho Nim began to condemn the young man with disapproving anger. The man was sure that if he turned his back on the battlefield now, it would be tantamount to betrayal. Their argument was silenced for a moment because the ship was wildly rocked. At that moment, the enemy vessel rammed the port side of their ship. The order was given to level the ship. Everyone understood that now it was necessary to leave the line of attack. The wounded Young Hoon did not understand what kind of plausible dream was happening now. Other wars have also begun to express their opinion that it is necessary to retreat. Turning to Manko Nim, they tried to reason with him, explaining that the ship was damaged now, and if they continued to stay in place, they would thereby allow the ship to be destroyed into splinters. At that moment, Young Hoon was very surprised. It seemed to him that all these people were addressing him. The man continued to argue furiously, he demanded that everyone stay in their places. Exuding confidence, he ordered to expect further action. Addressing another soldier, he said that, of course, he understands him, he feels weak and helpless, but they need to get together and continue to fight. There was still quite a bit left. If they retreat now without an order, they will be punished later according to military law. At that moment, the warrior treacherously pulled out his blade and slashed another from the back. The soldier, choking on his own blood, fell to the floor. Carefully wiping his sword from the blood, he said. Man Ho Nim died during an enemy arrow attack. That's how he would explain the death of his comrade to the top management. He continued to explain the future legend to everyone present in the hall. According to the official legend, after he was wounded by an arrow, he fell into the water. The body was never found. In the next few moments, he gave the order to turn the ship around immediately. From that moment on, they retreated from the battlefield. The samurai reasoned that they could not die so senselessly, so he was completely confident in his actions. Young Hoon was looking at him with disdain at this moment. Then a stranger came up to him. Carefully squatting down next to him, he began to encourage the guys. Then the stranger said that this is really a completely real reality. Young Hoon, completely distraught, began to scream furiously. He was yelling that no one there would dare to joke with him like that. 
Just a minute ago he was in his father's house, the guy did not understand at all what he could have done wrong, since he now had to suffer from unbearable pain. At this moment, the stranger stood in a stupor. He did not understand how a traveler could endanger his life a second after starting his journey. It was clearly the first time he had seen such a person. Young Hoon continued his speech, explaining that he didn't understand a word of what this guy was saying. At that moment, the guy's thoughts were only that he shouted in vain. After his efforts, the wound began to hurt only more. At that moment, the stranger stood up and said with surprise that he did not understand what Roulette was thinking at all, sending a man like Chong Hoon on a journey. And finally the stranger introduced himself. He turned out to be a messenger from June from the special forces. At that moment, he promised to help Young Hoon. But most importantly, he had to remember that all this was not a dream. The guy explained that there is only one way to go back. It is necessary to complete the roulette task. But the most important thing that needed to be listened to completely carefully was the reinforced concrete rule it was necessary to survive for sure. During the conversation, a strange stranger pulled an arrow out of Young Hoon's body. The guy was sitting on the floor in the cabin of the ship and that's in pain. At his sounds, the samurai standing nearby began to scold him for not getting an arrow like that. Young Hoon tried to explain that it wasn't him who did it, but that guy over there. But when they all turned around, there was no one in front of them. The guy just disappeared in an unknown direction. Soon the ship was safe. Arriving at the nearest land, Young Hoon found himself in the infirmary. Samurai Du touched the red hot blade right up to Chong Hoon's wound. He calmed the guy down, saying that there was very little left. He needs to take care of his wound, otherwise there could be serious consequences. Young Hoon himself was screaming in pain. Warriors were standing nearby and engaged in a lively conversation. It was clear from their mouths that terrible news had arrived. According to the fishermen, the entire flotilla was destroyed. Everyone stood in amazement. No one understood how the entire flotilla could have perished. The warrior continued to spread the news and said that no one still knows where the commander is, and the heads of Chanra and Chun Han were killed. The news was just terrible. Of all the 180 ships of the Joseon Dynasty Navy, only 12 ships survived. Finally, when one of the warriors finished treating Young Hoon's wound, he was able to go outside. After all the hellish torments, the exhausted guy stood under the rays of the hot sun. He looked at the whole scene and could not utter a word. There were many military tents around him. The local wars have set up camp right on the rock. The masts of ships could be seen on the horizon. The guy stood there and couldn't believe that all this was happening for real. The next thing the guy did was he tried to just at least wash up. Approaching the basin of water, he felt hellish pain. His thoughts could not calm down in any way. He constantly pondered the words of that fabulous creature. That stranger had made it clear to him that in order to get back, it was necessary to survive. That is, literally, he cannot die. Young Hoon bent over the basin of water and saw his reflection in it. On the smooth surface of the water, he saw a completely different man. It was at this moment that he realized that he looked exactly like this now. While the guy was leaning over the basin, an unknown man turned to him in his thoughts. Choi Siak Young was called that and asked if everything was okay with his wound. The guy realized that even the name is now different from his real one. In the next moment, the guy's nerves could not stand it. He poured water on his face, warm from the sun. He did it very hard, trying to seem to come to his senses. He couldn't believe that all this was real, it must be a dream after all. A terrible and long dream. But then he had a vision. It was as if his father was sitting in front of him, saying that it was much easier to convince himself that everything around him was an ordinary nightmare than to accept the harsh reality. A nightmare would clearly be better. Young Hoon raised his head in amazement and opened his eyes. The guy froze in place, not knowing how to treat everything. After that, Young Hoon found himself in the tent. A meeting was held, headed by an inspector. Everyone understood that they had escaped from the battlefield without waiting for an order from above. It could only mean one thing, if they found out about it, they would be sentenced to death. There was horror on the inspector's face, he clearly didn't want to die, because that's why they all escaped. For this reason of its own, it was decided to stay for now. At that moment, one of the warriors ran into the tent. He turned to the inspector with a message. The man was very surprised, what other message, from whom? The soldier who ran and said that the messages on behalf of the absent commander were again assigned to the position of naval commander. The warriors sitting next to Young Hoon breathed a sigh of relief. They were all wondering what they could be told, because what he could do with his small detachment, it was already completely late. Young Hoon looked at what was happening attentively, sweat trickled down his face, he could not figure out who they were talking about. At the same time, far from this place, a written message came to the naval commander in a house located on a huge rock. The resting man unfolded the scroll and read. The message said that it became known that in the last battle the number of sailors was reduced to 7,000. It also said that advice was given, if it was no longer possible to fight on the water, then it was necessary to go ashore and help one Su's army. The commander turned to the chronicler with imperturbable calm. He explained that his majesty was very concerned about the navy, so he would like to respond immediately. The commanders began to dictate. He reassured his majesty, saying that all was not lost yet. 
There are still 12 ships left. If you make every effort, there will be nothing in the world that a person cannot cope with. There was confidence in his speeches, he said that as long as the sun rises, the enemy will not gain control of the seas of Joseon. The naval commander stood on the shore of the cliff and looked into the distance. The scarlet sun was slowly setting on the horizon. The man looked into the distance with confidence. He felt that he had enough strength to defeat the enemy. Soon, the supreme commander arrived at the surviving vessels. The inspector fell to his knees and began to bow to the supreme commander, begging for mercy. The commander-in-chief asked him a direct question about how he managed to survive in. Jeong Seng Yuzus. The inspector continued to beg for mercy. He understood that he was very much to blame. The inspector had known everything for a long time. At that moment, he addressed the entire unit. Escaping from the enemy was considered a terrible sin. This sin could not be expiated even by death. But now the situation was so terrible that the commander-in-chief was ready to sacrifice his principles. He allowed the unit to give him a second chance. The soldiers stood at attention. Everyone listened very carefully. The commander-in-chief continued his speech and strongly recommended not to deviate from orders one step further. He warned if at least one goes to the battlefield, being weak in spirit, then he will personally cut the throat before the enemy does it. Young Hoon stood and looked attentively at everything that was happening. Finally, he realized that everything was happening exactly as in the era he was thinking about. Third chapter. All further actions were simply unimaginable. Young Hoon was sitting in the middle of all the events. Night was falling on their peaceful camp. Young Hoon was sitting on a big bench, couldn't believe himself. The guy understood that he had gone back in time to the moment of the Imjin War. Many facts began to come together in his head. He remembered the words of that strange type. He clearly explained that there was only one option to go back, and that was to complete the time roulette mission. In simple terms, to say if it's just to survive. The young man was sitting at a loss how to survive here. How long will he be able to survive at all and what will happen if he does die? The next moment, the kid had an idea. If this is the Joseon era, then he is a real person from the future. At that moment, he was filled with hope. The guy understood that he knew the whole future in advance. For the first time in his life, he was very happy that he was studying Korean history. Excitement lit up in the boy's eyes. Now the main mission was to remember everything. After all, the only way to continue this journey is to come up with the most innovative survival plan. To do this, you clearly need to remember every detail of the story. Well, alas, the happiness did not last long. He froze in horror. Young Hoon realized that he couldn't remember anything. It's been too long since he last took the university admission test. The guy, upset, sat on the bench and looked straight. He drew Borscht's attention to the noise coming from the voices of his colleagues. He didn't care at all at this moment about everything that was happening around him. Young Hoon quickly panicked. Although he hadn't forgotten a lot, he remembered some details. For example, he remembered well that the Imjin War was over in 1592. The guy desperately kept remembering the story. Episodes of old events surfaced before his eyes. He remembered that the ancient state was able to live 200 years in peace. But the post-war power of the state weakened and because of the wrong decisions of some commanders, King Xianzhou, who ruled everything then, he couldn't finish his train of thought because new news had arrived. Everyone listened attentively, an order was received from the king, a new investigator, Chong Lao, was appointed under the command of his majesty. The soldiers turned around, all trying desperately to figure out what the noise was about. In front of them was the following picture of a man in uniform on a horse. A soldier was standing next to him. It was this soldier who made too much noise, he shouted go ahead, follow the investigator. He introduced the man on horseback as Kim Ok Chu recommended by the head of justice. The captain came out of the tent at the noise. The investigator immediately greeted him. The man, in turn, asked why he came alone. The controller informed the arriving investigator that they had not had enough troops and supplies for a long time. The man on the horse glared at the controller and asked how there could be a shortage of troops and supplies, because the appointment to the commander of the fleet happened like a couple of days ago. He explained that the commander's job maintains proper security. The soldiers who were nearby could not stand such a rude attitude towards their commander. But the controller did not give, the conflict began, he agreed with the investigator. The investigator, feeling his perfect impunity, got down from his horse. He leaned right over the controller's ear and started saying that he had heard of a dozen ships capable of defeating enemies. But at the same time, he heard how the controller dared to be rude to his greatness and asked, is his arrogance still there? The investigator tried to bring the commander to the conflict, he continued to be sarcastic. Young Hoon was finally sure that he had not lost with the era, at that time, because of the indecent behavior of the commander, and the king, the whole country was in chaos. Young Hoon seemed to be in a trance. He was standing in the middle of the pitch black night. The area was illuminated only by standing files. The guy, carefully, looked at everything that was happening and put the facts together like a mosaic. Young Hoon finally understood. Here, the man standing in front of him was the most active and undervalued. He was one of those who quietly fought for their goal. It was Commander Yu Sang Zing. The guy continued to stand and think. The full moon was peeking out from behind the clouds. It illuminated everything around. This magical celestial object created in its own way a stunning coziness of this evening. Despite all the tense situation, 
The guy was completely calm at the moment. The night was in full swing. Young Hoon approached the man. This young kid finally decided to play by the rules of the game. The two of them were completely alone at the moment, so he took advantage of the moment. Turning to the commander, he broke away from the contemplation of the local nature. He asked what the soldier's name was. Young Hoon introduced himself by a different name. He remembered that he looked very different now, and that at the moment he was a different person, it was necessary to follow the rules. After introducing himself, the guy continued to explain why he came at all. He said that he had heard about Commander Yu Sang H. Sang. According to the rumors that he received, the guy had information that the captain in the first days of the war won the battle for the island of Hesando, after which he became commander of the navy. But what started out so great has recently been ruined. The captain was disgraced and imprisoned. The man looked at the boy in surprise. He wondered where he got this information from. The man choked and said he was surprised how quickly rumors spread. Also, looking directly at the guy, he noticed that he had heard that he was talking to Lee. Young Hoon resolutely continued his speech, he was determined to warn the man. The guy explained that he had seen him at an exhibition of a great man, and seeing all the negligence of the investigator as a soldier, he was outraged. The guy was sure that he trusted his people and offered to punish him until something bad happened. The man listened to this young soldier with a sinking heart. The boy's words pierced the man's thoughts like a sharp blade. Being in no great shock, he replied that the battlefield was not a resort at all. Standing in the night under a huge starry sky, the man continued. He was trying to convey to the guy that all he had to do was fight the enemies. The captain understood that there was absolutely no time to deal with personal matters right now. But at the same time, he understood why this young youth was so worried now. Young Hoon was taken aback. For the greenhouse, as if everything around was frozen in place, the moment dragged on endlessly. He understood that it would be very difficult to convince the captain now. After the man explained that now it's time to do something more. He walked past Young Hoon and explained that just as he can think about winning at such a time, so he should think about losing. Under the light of a bright moon, the guy tried to explain that this was not what he meant at all. In his opinion, the war was completely unprofitable. Young Hoon tried to convince the commander, but he stopped him. The man was standing a little ahead and tried to explain the behavior of the young soldier by saying that he was just scared. Young Hoon looked at the commander and realized that he was losing now. The guy decided not to restrain tact. The most important thing now was to convince the commander that he was right. Young Hoon explained that if something goes wrong, if we can't hold back, there's nothing left. The things we have done for life will be meaningless. These two were standing right on the shore of a huge ocean. The wind carried the leaves and ruffled their clothes. The commander, looking at the young man, tried to convey worldly wisdom. Because if you go, I wish you a happy life, you will die. However, if you are ready to die, you will have a path to life. Young Hoon looked at the commander with his mouth slightly open in amazement. The commander's words were quotes from The Art of Fighting. He explained that if you are a part of art, do not miss the opportunity to practice wherever you are. Young Hoon turned away and sighed heavily. The young man, looking into the distance correctly, noticed that he also had to be prepared for death. The commander standing at a distance from him, closing his eyes, felt the currents of the wind. At that moment, he merged with nature. His main advice right now was for a young soldier to have the courage. The night was very warm, the sky was almost completely cleared of clouds. The moon was shining so brightly that it was completely visible, as if it was day. The commander was trying to convey to Young Hoon that it is courageous to face death directly. But doing what is required of you at the right time is also courage. The man was standing right on the edge of the cliff. Young Hoon saw his expression. But the guy felt the commander's confidence and peace of mind. At that moment, he was learning the most important thing. You always have to go where it's scary. Although the enemy's movement cannot be read, there will probably be a big battle soon. Young Hoon was sweating all over at that moment, he was very worried. The guy called out to the commander and then said that if there was a battle tomorrow, well, you just need to imagine that this could happen. Then he clearly needs to be careful. At that moment, he tensed up all over. The excitement has reached its peak. The captain turned around and asked in surprise what he meant. At that moment, Young Hoon was very much lost. The guy said he wasn't 100% sure, he just felt that something was going to happen. The captain took a deep breath and humbly closed his eyes. He was tired of arguing with the young guy. Finally, he agreed and promised that he would keep this thought in his head. Little by little, night was replaced by morning. The sun was slowly rising from the horizon, bringing with it a new day. It all started at dawn, a huge flotilla sailed along the gorge. At the head was the captain of the Japanese navy, Takatora Tadu. He was sailing towards the enemies, waiting for his victory today. He knew that the might of his 7,000th army would be able to show itself in all its glory. At this moment, the commander of the Japanese naval raid, Captain Kirishima Michifis, was mocking the stupid to-do. On this fateful day, he was determined to get rid of the captain. According to his cunning plan, all this was supposed to happen even faster than he would destroy the Joseon fleet. With a sinister smile, Am understood that if he killed Commander Yu Sang Sin, then General Toyotomi would definitely recognize him. A man standing on the mast of a ship threatened in his dreams. In his mind, he understood that at this rate he would soon be able to become a general himself. But a soldier ran up and distracted him from his dreams. He informed the captain that a message had arrived. 
The captain reluctantly turned to the soldier and made a remark so that he did not dare to distract him with unimportant matters. The warrior apologized and said that this matter is very important. According to the latest news, the Joseon army blocked the road to Myungyan. The ships of the flotilla could no longer move. The way forward was completely cut off. The captain froze in amazement at the information received. At that moment, he felt as if he knew about the attack. Commander Joseon's ship was visible on the horizon. Their small flotilla was ready to defend itself. At that moment, every soldier of the Joseon army was ready to give his life for the sake of victory. Finally, the historic day of the battle has arrived. But even at that moment, Young Hoon was able to disgrace himself, he threw up overboard, as local soldiers said, he clearly had seasickness. Fourth chapter, defensive commands were heard every second. The guns on the ships were constantly at the ready. Young Hoon clearly fulfilled the assigned tasks. Apparently, the owner of this body was an artilleryman. The guy made such an assumption simply because every movement seemed so familiar. It was muscle memory. With deft movements, he scooped gunpowder onto a shovel and carefully fell asleep in the cannon. The very idea that guns were invented at that time amazed him. Young Hoon knew that gunpowder was loaded into this iron barrel. Finally, the wick was carefully immersed, the powder was covered with paper and wad, after the core was delayed. The most important point was that it was necessary to score all the contents very carefully. And of course, it was necessary not to confuse anything. In general, there were different types of cartridges, but most often steel cores were used in such guns. The fuse was ignited, a bright fire and hundreds of small sparks scattered in a circle. A couple of moments later, a deafening explosion was heard. After that, the core flew out in a fraction of a few seconds. The guy looked at the whole process in amazement. To see the live work of this weapon, and even to participate in the process myself, was simply dizzying. Young Hoon clearly understood that these were explosive cores, after the shot they shattered into many small fragments, and destroyed the enemy's manpower. The fleet was also armed with huge cannons. The infected core flew for miles ahead. Reaching the target, it hit entire ships. Indeed, the core itself looked more like some kind of rocket. The enemies stared in amazement at everything that was happening and could not do anything. After hitting the first ships, the Joseon army officially opened fire with cannons, thereby starting the war. Young Hoon looked at everything with horror in his eyes. The guy was amazed at the cruelty of ancient people. Further actions were very lively. The soldiers on the ship noticed that the enemy's movement was very suspicious. They were sure that they should have crashed long ago. But, apparently, the opponents decided to bypass them from the side. The wars wondered what they should do now. After all, if something goes wrong, the opponents will definitely surround them. At this moment, Lai Songsing was confused, he could not get ahead and behind the small ships in any way. Sasin's army at that moment decided to retreat immediately. The flotilla decided to take advantage of the current that was against them, because with the help of it they could go back. Lai Songsing, realizing the sadness of the situation, decided to attack anyway. He tried to inspire the soldiers with his speeches. He urged them not to be afraid, even if they were surrounded. In any case, they have to keep attacking. The commander-in-chief was cruel. In his statements, he said that even if tens of thousands of enemy ships sail on them, they should break into the front. The enemy army remarkably saw how many of their ships were shot down. The British forget about sinking ships and keep shooting. At this time, Chief Lai Songsing decided to take advantage of the confusion of the foreign army. While they were reloading the guns, they had to advance immediately. It was impossible to miss this chance. On board, they began to row frantically. It was necessary to shorten the distance as much as possible until it was possible to board them. Bullets and rewards rained down on Lai Songsing's main ship. The army of the flotilla on the ship tried desperately to defend itself. The warriors tried to warn that an enemy ship was sailing right at them. One of them offered to ask for help from the ships that were behind. The captain flatly refused. The commander-in-chief was completely confident in his people, because they had been through a lot of battles with him. But with all this, the soldier hastened to notice that now the ships were moving away from them. At this time, on a Joseon army warship, soldiers were trying to sort out the course of events. They noticed that the commander's ship was attacking. The commander of this vessel asked if there were any other problems, but that the soldiers noticed that their ship was damaged, so they could not change the direction of movement. The sailor with the sharpest vision noticed that the commander's ship was still moving, moving directly towards the enemy. The soldiers were confused, they did not understand what the commander was thinking about. Then everyone noticed that the commander's ship had raised the flag, which means they had to follow him. The ship's commander hesitated, he did not know what to do. He understood that following the doomsday commander-in-chief meant certain death. Even Wu Young Hoon, who did not understand strategy, understood that it all looked very crazy. There were too many opponents. The guy didn't understand what Lai Sung Sing was thinking, as if he had gone into oblivion, completely forgotten about everything. After all that had happened, Young Hoon finally understood the commander's words. He yelled that they should attack immediately. The commander of the ship thought that the guy had gone crazy. He did not understand how he was ready to commit suicide. 
Young Hoon replied that even if they were surrounded, this place was too narrow, so if they couldn't move, then so would the opponents. The guy explained that there is very little space in the gorge, so the enemy's big ships will not be able to squeeze through, if they attack right now, they will be able to win. The ship's captain understood everything, but he believed that it was too dangerous to attack now. The two began to argue furiously. The captain of the ship tried to remind what had happened earlier, because after their words that the soldiers had a chance to win, many people died. Young Hoon stood his ground. The opinion about the offensive was not only his. The guy tried to reason with everyone on the ship. To call to conscience, because how much more do they want to hide if they just wait for victory will not come by itself. He explained that on the battlefield of doubt means to die. If you want to win, you just have to fight to the end. While Young Hoon was trying to prove to the captain the correctness of his judgments, the captain began to slowly move towards him. When he came very close, he hit the guy in the face with great force. Young Hoon fell. The ship's captain, filled with rage, gave the order to advance. The soldiers stood up in amazement. The captain was determined to catch up with the commander's ship. In the next instant, commands about preparing cannons from the right side for the attack began to pour in. An order was received to protect the main ship to the last. If someone blocks their way, then it is immediately necessary to sink them. There was a commotion on the ship, everyone went about their business. The captain turned to Young Hoon. He was outraged that an ordinary soldier dared to raise his voice to the highest rank. He ordered them to immediately return to their work. The guy enthusiastically infected guns. His every movement was refined and filigree. One of the fighters approached him. He asked the guy how he thought they could survive. Is it even possible to win here? To which Young Hoon enthusiastically replied that everything would definitely work out. You'll see today is the last day of the war. Fifth chapter. Images popped up before the guy's eyes. He recalled that the main task is to survive. You need to be brave. My father's words sounded like a loud bell in my head. He remembered to hold on to the end. Even if it will be very difficult, being face to face with death. As he lit another fuse, he wondered if the day was the right choice. Maybe it was better to stay, then there would definitely be more chances to survive. However, Young Hoon knew that he would definitely regret it if he didn't do anything. The commander-in-chief heard a voice. Anwi said that you should not worry about the right side, you should focus on the left. The commander-in-chief stared at the ship in amazement. Without thinking for a second, he began to accuse the commander of negligence. After all, the commander-in-chief did not see how they were hanging out from behind. He again accused the soldiers of cowardice. Anwi asked for forgiveness and noticed that they are here right now, so let the commander-in-chief give them a chance to help at least this time. Lai Songxing smiled and made a remark to the guy, remarking that if he messed up, he would obviously be executed. On the port side, they noticed that Captain An's ship was out ahead. The commander-in-chief noticed that it seemed that the captain of the enemy ship also understood something. After not wasting a second, the commander-in-chief gave the order to attack. They couldn't lose now. The main task was to protect the main ship. There was no way back. Events were developing at a breakneck pace. There were too many opponents, even if they were now sinking enemy ships one by one, then new ones were arriving again and again. A soldier standing on the deck tried to warn that the ship would soon be surrounded, but at that moment he was shot. He fell right into the water. In the next instant, huge metal hooks began to dig into the side of the ship. Young Hoon was already tired of everything that was happening. It seemed to him that a little more and he would go deaf from all this noise. At that moment, everyone noticed that they were climbing from below. Young Hoon froze in horror. Enemy soldiers were climbing the ropes right up to the deck. The warriors tried to defend themselves and cut the ropes so that the enemies could not get up. After a couple of seconds, an enemy appeared right in front of Young Hoon with a saber at the ready. The guy froze in horror. For a second it seemed to him that he would die. But at that very moment an arrow hit the enemy, and he flew back. The main character froze in amazement. Turning back, he saw that one of the warriors had saved him. He remarked with a laugh that it would be very bad if the guy who says such cool things would die first. Young Hoon even laughed himself. Then he felt someone behind him touching his shoulder. Behind him stood that mysterious stranger. It was only now that he saw a nice-looking girl in him. Young Hoon yelled that she scared him very much. The girl hastened to please him that he finally passed the tests, and she said it was time for him to go home. The guy was surprised and said that he needed to wait a little. He still had things to do here. To which the stranger replied that there was no need to worry. She pointed into the distance and said that he did a great job, was able to turn the whole situation around. Now this fight will definitely not lose without him. They looked into the distance and saw the battle going on. The enemies have already climbed aboard the main ship but the warriors on the ship were clearly not at a loss. At that moment, they witnessed how the commander-in-chief in one movement easily struck the enemy. The girl turned to the traveler again and said that it was time for them. His world was waiting for a guy. The girl hit the deck with her spear and everything sparkled. Young Hoon was back in his father's room. The guy stumbled to the floor. His head hurt like hell. It was getting dark in my eyes. Suddenly, he was finally able to realize that he had returned back to the future. He was lying half-dead on the cold floor of the room. Sweat broke out on his face. The young man convulsively stretched out his hand to the phone. When he unlocked the phone, he realized that today was until the 21st of February, and in the notes it was indicated that the study was beginning. 
He stared at the phone screen in confusion. He reached out his hand to his face and forcefully pinched himself. Having reason that once they feel pain, it means that this is not a dream. But at the same moment he realized that even then, being in the past, he felt pain. So, all this was also a reality. The guy laughed, it seems that due to stress he had the most unusual dream in his life. He felt as if he had lived in a dream for a couple of days. I still had a headache. For a while, he even thought he was going crazy. With a wild thirst, he headed for the kitchen. When the guy came in, he saw something. A girl was sitting on the floor rummaging in his refrigerator. Her appearance was clearly unusual. They looked at each other in surprise. Young Hoon thought again that maybe he was still sleeping. The guy was standing as if in a kind of trance. He knew it was her again. The girl appeared out of nowhere several times already, spoke in riddles and disappeared. The girl addressed the guy as a traveler. She was glad he was awake. Congratulating her on the successful completion of the task and returning home, she asked if he liked the adventure. The guy behaved rudely, he asked who she was to enter someone else's house. The girl smiled and said it was time to explain everything. She carefully noticed that his face was a strange color, and offered to sit down. The girl poured barley tea. At the moment, the guy noticed that she was pretty nice with his father's things. To begin with, the girl decided to introduce herself. According to her, if reduced to human language, then she is an angel. But at the same time, demons. As the guy noticed, in general she is not a person. The girl smiled, a small firework shot out of her fingers. She praised the traveler for being so smart. The girl asked what else the guy noticed. Young Hoon said that at first it seemed to him that it was just a dream or he was going crazy. But then comparing all the facts, he realized that everything happened somehow because of this subject. She praised the traveler. The guy, in turn, asked what kind of thing it was. The sweet lady replied that this was the roulette of time. She advised the guy to try to see her, pay attention to how the numbers are arranged. Then she told me that the earth rotates around its axis in 24 hours, then people began to call it days. And at some point they started tying numbers to the clock. Soon the day began to add up to a month, and the months together became years. He realized, if you look at the numbers, the arrow points to 1597th year. Just then there was a battle in which he participated. He was shocked by the realization of what was happening. After all, it turns out that all he experienced was time travel. He sat and looked at the time roulette. After a few seconds, he suggested that she could not go back to the time before our era. To which the girl replied angrily, of course, maybe these numbers were created only so that people would understand. Young Hoon continued, okay, even if we assume that traveling in time is possible, then why would he move into someone else's body at all? And why does this girl disappear and appear whenever she wants? The guy didn't understand a lot, to which the girl simply replied that it was necessary to accept these things without questions. Young Hoon was surprised. He could not come to terms with these rules of the game. She replied that even if she tried to explain now, he still wouldn't understand. After all, these things would be beyond human understanding. The girl looked at the mug of hot tea and continued to say that she herself this roulette world is altogether a complex system that people do not understand. The guy couldn't figure out why and why he had to go through all this. After all, it was quite obvious that the time roulette appeared in front of him for no particular reason. The girl looked at the guy with interest and surprise. She hastened to convince him that it was not like that at all. The girl was holding a roulette wheel in her hand and the policeman's roulette by itself fulfills a wish. The girl explained with sadness in her heart that from the beginning to this moment roulette was looking for creatures to fulfill their desires. The roulette of time has existed until now, fulfilling people's wishes with the help of their abilities. Young Hoon looked at the girl carefully and continued to listen. She explained that people have never fulfilled the wishes of the roulette itself, so travelers can now use it according to their needs, but the most important thing is to know the measure. The guy with trepidation in his soul asked if it was exactly possible to fulfill desires. The girl cautiously warned him to think carefully about everything he was going to say to roulette. My thoughts were confused in my head. The guy wondered if you changed his life something after time travel, or he's still the same as he was before. Suddenly he heard the phone ring. The girl looked with interest at everything that was happening. The guy hesitantly continued to look. Then a nice girl asked him to pick up the phone, because isn't it something important? Out of politeness, Young Hoon asked if she was against it. To which the girl replied that they would obviously see each other again, because his travels had just begun. Before she disappeared into space again, he hurried to ask, what is her name? The girl smiled and said that she had almost forgotten. How do people put such a deep meaning into names? She said he could call her June. He picked up the phone on the other line, they were talking from the hospital. From the news he received, he learned that everything was fine with his father. Vital signs returned to normal. Although he hadn't woken up yet, it was clearly much better. The guy also found out that the reception hours are about to start, so he can pass. When he entered the intensive care unit, he saw his father lying on the couch. He was wearing an oxygen mask, and he looked obviously unwell. Young Hoon sat in deathly silence, looking at dad. The hospital smelled of medicines and all sorts of devices were constantly beeping. Looking at all this, he decided to try to do the impossible. He decided not to fall into complete despair. He understood that his father clearly would not want him to sit and just whine. 
Lieutenant Yoon Chol H. Wen distracted the guy from his gloomy thoughts. The man looked very nice and friendly. The guy, as if by chance, clarified whether he was engaged in his father's business. To which the lieutenant replied that it was absolutely true. They had just returned from a crime scene. They were sitting on the couch, the lieutenant was trying to explain many things. It was clear that if the victim had been taken to the hospital immediately, the consequences would not have been so serious. The man was very sympathetic, everything was obviously hard for him. In his opinion, leaving a person in such a place is like killing. The victim's son asked if there were any witnesses on the spot. The lieutenant was upset, said that, apparently, there was no one at all, since everything happened on a mountain road, but they are still looking for possible witnesses. Then Young Hoon said that most likely, there must surely be cameras nearby, because even on a mountain road you can see which cars are coming in. If you look at all the cameras around the crime scenes, you can find the criminal's car. The lieutenant stopped the boy. He explained that they themselves also first thought about surveillance cameras. They even checked all the registrars of local residents. They were able to see her license plate car. Young Hoon asked what the problem was then, because they could easily find out who the owner was. But then the completely gloomy and saddened lieutenant explained that the car was illegal. The car was specially registered in advance for one person, and someone else drives it. Jong Hoon's mind was full of hell. It was obviously hard to realize what had happened. The lieutenant with a drooping head explained that the criminal had abandoned the car after the whole incident. The man apologized and said that it seemed that so far everything, the person who hit his father would be very difficult to find. Seventh chapter. Anger overwhelmed the boy. He said with disgust, how could it be so easy to say such things? They can tell him that I'm going to give up so easily. The lieutenant hurried to calm the kid down. The lieutenant explained that he was not going to give up. They would, of course, continue the investigation. But Young Hoon was already furious, he said that he had just heard how they were going to stop looking for the culprit. After all, this, according to them, was impossible. The lieutenant began to justify himself, holding his head. He assured that he wanted to tell about the necessary name to find the criminal. In his defense, he said that if they wanted to let things take their course, how would they even find the villain's vehicle? He understood the excited kid. Asking not to worry, he assured that he would do everything possible to find the culprit. The guy didn't want to let up at all. A malicious grin appeared on his face. He snapped with the lieutenant and provoked a conflict. At this moment, he didn't know who even crippled his father, so he clearly couldn't be calm. At that moment, the lieutenant suggested visiting the crime scene. As the man thought, at this moment it was necessary to calm him down somehow. Towards nightfall they reached this mountain road. The track was very long and winding. There were thickets of trees and bushes around. They walked along the asphalt until they stopped it near a pool of blood. The lieutenant walked a few steps ahead, lighting the way with a flashlight. He explained that this area is private, so they can't go back and forth endlessly, but apparently no one was here right now. Young Hoon didn't understand at all why his father decided to take a walk here. Interest devoured the boy from the inside. The lieutenant turned to him and said that, to tell the truth, he also did not understand very much. As the man said, they expected to get an answer to this question from their son. After going a little further, he showed where the criminal's vehicle was located. They were standing in the middle of pitch darkness. The flashlight illuminated the horizon, and they saw a car in the water in the distance. As the lieutenant specified, the criminal's vehicle was spotted right here, but he turned out to be quite inventive. Young Hoon didn't understand how the car ended up here. The lieutenant explained that the criminal had attached a stone to the gas pedal and destroyed the snails. Two men were standing on the shore of the lake. The silence began to press from within. The next moment, the lieutenant offered to stop everything. Now it was necessary to move forward and look for witnesses, because this was the primary task. A wave of hatred swept over the guy again. He promised that they would find him at any cost, because sooner or later the criminal would be caught, and they would make him apologize to his father and pay for everything. The lieutenant turned to the guy and asked if he had a lot of money. Young Hoon did not immediately understand what he was talking about. The lieutenant explained that he understands his feelings. He feels anger and disappointment. The employee understood that this kid is not experiencing any joy right now and is constantly wondering why it all happened to him. He was familiar with these feelings, because his younger brother was hit to death by a car. Young Hoon looked at the man with surprise. The lieutenant went on to explain that at that time he was the same age as the guy now. The man then went crazy in the same way trying to find the street. Lowering his head, he continued his story. At that time, he spent a lot of time and money. He understood that it was very hard for the guy right now. But he tried to explain that when he came to himself, his life was turned upside down. He could not do anything. It was after this turning point that he became a detective with the aim of revenge. But with all this, there are things that even a policeman can't do. The guy started to get angry again. He considered the lieutenant's words as a call to forget about the criminal. The same one, with perfect calmness on his face, explained that he did not mean it at all. He just did not need to risk his life. Of course, he did not want to say these words, but he voiced that the main thing now is that his father is alive. He apologized again and sent the kid home. When Young Hoon returned home, he couldn't come to his senses. He was on his knees again, leaning on the couch face down. 
Pictures floated before his eyes. He still remembered the scene of the accident, as if he was there right now. He understood that the place was very dark and quiet. In the boy's head, it just didn't fit that his father could be there alone. He went back to his father's room. He took the roulette of time and realized that just recently he would not have gotten involved with this suspicious thing in any way. However, now, remembering all the events he had experienced, he asked to fulfill a wish. He wanted to find performances at any cost, because whoever wounded his father wounded him. Roulette time began to publish aspirations. The guy thought what a selfish coward the one who ran away, thinking only of himself. At that moment, he wanted to kill with his own hands. After the fit of anger passed, he realized everything he had said. He convulsively began to shout that no, 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 that's not what he meant at all. He hoped that Roulette would not fulfill such a wish. When he realized that nothing had happened, he breathed a sigh of relief. Closing his eyes and concentrating on everything that was happening, he made a wish again. Now he wanted to find the culprit so that he would be brought before the law. The time roulette sparkled again. The last step was to press the button at the bottom of the roulette wheel and set the correct time. This time he went back to the past again. The first digit is one, then eight and finally three. A bright glow lit up the whole room. But the guy turned out to be together, in which he did not expect to be at all. He was in a large, richly decorated hall. June was sitting in front of him, judging him with her eyes. The poor guy immediately broke into a sweat and decided to ask why she did it. The girl was looking intently at Young Hoon. After that, she asked why it was so complicated at all. The easiest thing was to kill him. The guy explained that in the human world there are laws for punishing a person, there are their own processes, he could not just take someone's life. The girl looked at him and assumed that he wanted to take revenge with the hands of other people on the man who killed his father. Hearing this, the guy screamed that his father was alive. And in general, it's not just about revenge, but also about justice. June hated the word justice more than anything in the world. In her opinion, it was one of the most confusing concepts invented by man. She looked at the guy with contempt. A smile appeared on his face. He eagerly asked if she really wanted to convince him. She sighed heavily and closed her eyes. There was nothing like that in her thoughts, because she was just a connecting link. Her mission is to deliver roulette instructions. Space began to distort again. The girl decided to tell about the task. It was necessary to fulfill the client's request. But she decided to warn right away that it would be much more difficult than surviving on the battlefield. The next second, a girl disappeared in front of him, and when a completely different lady. She looked unhappy and was clearly swearing. She accused him of rudeness and selfishness on his part. In her opinion, it was indecent to make a lady wait, especially since there is so little space here and the workers are unfriendly. While the girl chatted, he looked at her extraordinarily beautiful appearance. Long white hair, big gray eyes and regular facial features. I couldn't take my eyes off her. After the girl said. According to her, after leaving the police, the young man became a private investigator. Isn't she right? Young Hoon was really scared. At that very moment, he realized that he was now a foreigner. He began to stumble. It was very uncomfortable for him, because the memories from the Imjin War were still so vivid. He thought he would end up somewhere in Korea. At home, she looked reproachfully at the man. She asked if he wanted to invite her to sit down. Continuing to stutter, he asked, of course. The next second, he slammed his fist on the arm of the chair. The guy knew that he urgently needed to understand the situation. He didn't understand where they were and who he was. And what is the essence of the task, which is called a client request. The girl continued to look at him questioningly. Eighth chapter. After that, when Young Hoon decided to calm down, he was going to collect a database of information first. The first thing he timidly asked if she was his client. The girl pushed through. She took off her hat and said with sadness in her eyes that the man decided to talk to her rather rudely. Okay, though. Apparently, it's all because she's just a maid. The girl started crying very hard. The guy sat and continued to sweat. Soon he could not stand the women's tears. The most important thing for him now was to understand what was going on. And since this girl is familiar with the owner of the body, then he needs to trust the body just like last time. He changed in front of Rebecca. And he said that his tongue began to rush when he saw her sparkling gray eyes. He claimed that it was quite easy for a man to forget how to talk to such a beautiful woman. Young Hoon said all sorts of nice things to the lady and told her to come up to him a cute kitty. A chill ran through him from the last words. He grabbed for the goal in a panic, for him the heat was failed. He was more than sure that he had screwed up, and she was going to get mad at him. The girl immediately had tears, she said that she could not even offend such a cutie. And although he offended her very much, but when she sees him, she becomes a weak lady. The girl got up and walked towards him. These two were in a fairly spacious room. The furniture, apparently, clearly cost a lot of money. There was a hefty picture hanging on the wall. The girl decided not to delay, got up and began to approach the man. She explained that her boss, Monsieur Albert, had sent her here. She asked if he had already heard about Natalie's death. The girl came up and snuggled up to the guy. The girl was tenderly hugging his hand. She said that as soon as she mentioned his name to the owner, he was immediately sure that he would be able to find the killer. The guy replied that of course. And finally the first clues of Monsieur instead of Mr. Shirley this is France. The girl sat up and began to whisper in the guy's ear. She only asked not to mention this assignment especially with the police, because it would be bad if the rumors spread. 
She went on to say that the Paris police and detectives offered to help in the search, but Monsieur Albert refused. She was holding the man's head, he was looking at her very carefully. Young Hoon could not understand why the owner refused to investigate. The maid replied without much emotion that she did not know herself, but suggested that he simply did not trust the police. After her words, the guy experienced strange feelings. He couldn't describe it with anything he had experienced before in his life, but it clearly looked like a premonition of something serious. He took these feelings as a signal from the body, it clearly wanted to tell him something. The guy turned to the girl. He gently put his arm around her shoulders and asked if she knew anything else. He assured her that he needed her help now. The girl was very surprised. She looked at the man with a little excitement. The girl could not believe that the murderer of Napoleon's children, whose prisoner no one can recognize the Parisian king of the night, Eugene Francois Vidoc needs her help. Young Hoon sighed heavily and closed his eyes. At that moment, his acting was just brilliant. He turned to Rebecca with a little gasp and asked her not to do that. Looking straight into the girl's eyes, he tried to explain. Although she knew perfectly well about his brilliant career, but now in the face of such a lovely lady, he is just a man walking. Rebecca froze, she is very attentive. She was listening to every word. After listening to the end, she exclaimed joyfully. According to her, he was so good that he knew the way to a woman's heart. Even Young Hoon himself was very surprised by himself. Having melted under the spell of the man, the girl gave up. She told a little secret. Before the murder, the late Natalia, Monsieur Albert's daughter, left without her father's knowledge. Sneaking into the basement while no one sees, she took a very valuable item from her father's safe. But when her body was found on the river bridge, she had nothing with her. Young Hoon stood close to the girl. He was talking about where the girl should go at such a late hour completely alone. After all, even her father didn't know anything. The girl smiled for a moment and touched Young Hoon's lips. She spoke again, this time saying that her excommunication from home was understandable enough. Most likely, at such a late hour, she went to meet her lover. The next second, she gently kissed Young Hoon on the cheek. She put on her hat and walked away, saying that she had told him everything she could know. She said goodbye to the man and left. Young Hoon sat like a cotton ball, blushed all over and lost his mind for a few seconds. But pretty quickly coming to his senses, he wondered whose body it was and what that person looked like. Going to the closet, he looked into the reflection of the glass, there was an old man. Young Hoon noticed that he was clearly not handsome and, in addition, bald. Young Hoon understood that it was necessary to find the killer as soon as possible, which means that first you need to examine the crime scene. Going outside, he found himself in the beautiful streets of Paris. The guy could never have imagined that he would end up here like this. As might have been expected, the city turned out to be very beautiful. While he was loitering around the streets, he noticed that there were a lot of tramps and beggars here. The difference between rich and poor was great. You can even say it was amazing. Right on the move, he summed up the results, his name is Vidoc. He used to be a police officer, an investigator, and now runs his own business. Apparently he was a detective. Well, or in other words, he is a detective. The victim whose murder he is investigating was Natalia Albert. The girl was 21 years old. The girl's body was found in the morning near the river Seine with a head wound. The guy stood on the bridge and looked at a similar purple spot. It is directly embedded in the stone along the pavement to the very base. It was clear to the guy why Monsieur Albert wanted to find the killer. However, he did not understand why there was such secrecy, why it was impossible to tell anyone about the mission. He knew perfectly well that if he refused to help the police, everything would only get more complicated. Young Hoon stood in his thoughts, when suddenly a man called out to him. Turning around, he saw a shabby-looking man with a bottle in his hand. He was obviously delighted to meet Mr. Vidoc. The man asked why the investigator was hanging around the city alone. Young Hoon was confused and began to mumble excuses. The man immediately caught on to his words. But without waiting for an answer, he passed by. His behavior was clearly strange. Young Hoon looked at him. The man looked like an ordinary beggar. But the fact that he was familiar with the owner of the body was alarming. Maybe he was previously a policeman, because how else would they be familiar with? Then it dawned on him. He began to remember Rebecca's words. He immediately started calling the man trying to stop him. He ran up to the old man and apologized, justifying his rude behavior by saying that he was in the clouds. The guy asked how the man was doing. The man laughed, accusing the man of forgetfulness because it was not the first time he had forgotten about his tested eyes and ears, he expressed his disappointment. Finally, Young Hoon finally understood something. This is probably what he needed right now. They leaned on the railing and continued the conversation. Young Hoon was interested in whether the man has been here often lately, specifically somewhere in the area of the Seine River. He in turn replied that he was always here. The man took a sip of his drink and explained that since he had nowhere to spend the night, he had to wander back and forth through these stinking streets. The guy sighed sympathetically. After that, I asked if he noticed anything strange here, for example, a fight or maybe a very rich girl was passing here. Or maybe this rich girl was fighting with someone. Saying these words, he changed the tone of his voice to a more serious one and sternly looked at the man. The man burst out laughing, calling Vidoc lucky, he asked for clarification if he was talking about the girl who had recently been found dead here. If so, he must have seen her that night. 
Young Hoon bribed the man to be more accommodating and outspoken. Grabbing the coin, he was about to start haggling with Young Hoon. But he laughed and said that let's just do without it. After all, they are old friends. Ninth chapter. The men laughed again and replied that it was still possible to expect from Vidoc. He noted that the man has a gift. He knew how to communicate much better than these pretty detectives. Young Hoon realized that he had bumped into one of Vidoc's informants. Delighted with the situation, he asked, well, what happened that evening? He needed information from the very beginning to the very end in as much detail as he could tell. As the man said, it was very dark that night. The girl was running somewhere. But all of a sudden she was called out. The girl stopped and turned around. Two people were standing near the river and talking. Up to this point, the man somehow did not pay much attention to them. But in an instant, the girl swung and hit the man's face with her palm. Then finally, he came out to the noise. The man was shouting loudly. He couldn't believe she actually meant it. He specifically clarified so that the investigator would not have unnecessary questions. The man himself was quite far away, so he did not hear the entire dialogue. But some phrases were quite loud. In one of these, he heard a man talking about some problems that his father might have. The girl was always trying to go somewhere. Another person tried to stop her. Young Hoon interrupted the man, asking the question, where could the girl come off like that? He replied that he must have heard about the secret garden anyway. The two continued to quarrel, then suddenly the girl pushed him away and screamed. The girl from Tosh screamed that he was disgusting, he was a traitor. Yes, how dare he threaten at all. The man tried to calm her down. Finally, that fateful moment came. A scuffle began. The man was shouting at the woman, and then she fell. The stranger was very much surprised by this. While he stood in amazement, looking at the pool of blood under her head, someone began to approach. Without waiting for someone to appear, he grabbed a small box and disappeared. Apparently, it was just an accident. Then soon the police came, but the girl was already dead. Young Hoon thanked him and rewarded the man with a coin again. Having said that, it's a bonus. He advised the man to have a good meal. He thanked him and said that he could contact him at any time. As he said in the end, it must be remembered that all the terrible cases in Paris are always watched by his friend. Young Hoon walked away, lost in thought. Now he knew that whoever killed Natalia knew her. After the incident, he stole her thing. Most likely, he knew what it was, and he also mentioned her father. But everything that was happening clearly did not look like a love story. He did not understand why Rebecca thought that Natalia went to meet her lover. In the evening, he met Rebecca on purpose at a table in a local cafe. Having asked a question of concern to him, he received the answer that Natalia always talked about love when the opportunity arose. It so happened that quite recently she began to leave at night, so Rebecca thought about a possible lover. Young Hoon asked, and what kind of love could it be? Rebecca explained that there were moments, for example, she does chores around the house as usual. And suddenly the girl asks the maid, what is love? Why do some people love others? In her confusion, Rebecca responded very vaguely to the concept of love, in her opinion. Most likely, this is when it feels good at the sight of another person. And they love, probably, because it's nice. The girl wondered how Rebecca thought. And then he told me that love makes people live. She said she thought about it a lot in the last one. And I thought I would like to learn how to be a philanthropist. Young Hoon, who was listening to all this nonsense, sat in disbelief. He tried to explain to Rebecca that a philanthropist is not exactly that. The man said that this love for all living beings is when you see all people as your friends, regardless of their status and position in society. The girl was surprised, but at the same time upset, since, apparently, she did not have a boyfriend. And at that moment I asked myself the question, why then she left every night? The man had only one explanation for this, but it was only a hypothesis. Continuing a nice conversation with Rebecca, he noticed that Paris has become noisy in recent years. The girl agreed. They remembered how it used to be better. In those days when people didn't gather together for the sake of protests. When the army wasn't walking around the city or something like that. The girl said that on such days Monsieur Albert is very angry. He says mudbloods are putting pressure on the proud, French royal family. Then the man thought about it and finally understood. He asked the girl if her employer was a member of the royal family. She was very surprised. She didn't understand what the man was talking about. The man continued to say that now this country is not even there. The whole of humanity is expecting great changes. The girl stared at him in amazement. She couldn't figure out what he was talking about. The man said that now, after a certain period, all people will be able to live with equal worlds. And then he remembered exactly the year on roulette began at 183. And all this meant that it was now the beginning of the 19th century. All people are equal now. The fire of freedom is shaking the world. This is the beginning of the French Revolution. The girl exclaimed in shock, is it really a revolution? The man said that the main values of the revolution are freedom, so as not to be suppressed, equality of all people and 
The phrase for him, the girl continued. She named three fundamental foundations, freedom, equality and fraternity. The guy agreed with her, and she finally understood what the message in the newspaper meant. The girl decided to ask the man if he really believes that the deceased was a revolutionary without her father's knowledge. He explained to her that this was just a hypothesis, he needed to find out who Natalia was communicating with. He asked the girl if she knew where the secret garden was. Young Hoon understood that at that time the residents of Paris, who supported the revolution, organized a detachment at the head of the protest. He didn't know if this protest was independent. But if Natalia was also a member of the revolutionaries, then the word killer referred to her father. That would explain everything. Young Hoon was so carried away that he only now noticed Rebecca walking next to him. The girl led him by the arm into the secret garden. For her, this whole evening was like a date. The secret garden turned out to be just the name of the bar. The girl asked the young man if the traitor who killed the lady would be here. He replied that they would have to find out now. 